start recording and start streaming. Uh, we're streaming this to an unlisted YouTube uh, video as well as to Hell Twitch. Yeah. Um, people who are watching it on the live side of Twitch are not going to like probably the fact that we're going to be ignoring them, but uh, I can't see their <laughs> messages. I don't care. I, You know what? It's only there so that someone might accidentally stumble into this. But all right, with that, welcome everybody to Capital Monday's episode whatever. This is the one where we continue Fred Mosley. Uh, this is the second in the series on Met Fred Mosley's critique of Michael Heinrich and really, this is the first, uh, you know, contemporary defense of the labor theory of value uh, that we're reading. It's a deep dive into chapter one of Capital. It's a whole book on chapter one of Capital and against Michael Heinrich's uh, reading of chapter one of Capital. And just to summarize uh, what it, it all comes down to is Mosley said the most important disagreement between Heinrich and myself is whether the magnitude of value is determined solely by socially necessary labor time and production prior to an independent of exchange or also depends on supply and demand in exchange after production. But I will not neglect the qualitative dimension. A quantity is a quantity of something. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what that all means, but uh, before we dive back into it, Nance, how's it going, man? Chilling, man. It's a, it's a new year, dude. I can't believe it's 2024. It doesn't feel like it. it it's honestly, in, in a way, it still feels like 2020. 10 years ago, it was 2014. Wow. And 13 years ago, it was 2011. Yeah. Right? It's crazy. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah so anyway um new year same thing new so year. same thing yeah this is exciting everybody because capital mondays has been a blast to be doing uh we took a couple weeks off but it won't make a difference on your guys's end because from your end these just keep releasing on sundays and there'll be literally no gaps at this point, we have a few people following along. Um, I know Max got really excited when he saw that we're doing this. I know Ken said that he's in the background, like taking notes and stuff. I sent him an invitation to the Google Doc for our notes. I'm hoping that if he doesn't, at least someone eventually in the future will, you know, come along and make a bunch of additions or suggested corrections, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, how do you feel about the engagement th this has been receiving so far? It's been uh, honestly a little a little more than I expected, at least right out the gate. I didn't expect it like the the first stream had, I guess, relatively a shitload of people watching it live when it premiered. Um, and I think it's it's maybe fallen off a little since then because there were a lot more people who were there for the novelty there for the memes there to talk shit but there are still people quietly watching who are too busy to talk shit too busy to shit post um who are following along and taking notes um and having conversations with them on the back end has been really cool to be uh, like it, it it's we're we're doing it we're reading it um but there already is a larger group of people invested in it in a way um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's it's the shit and yeah, it's, it's only going to continue to fucking to grow from there like they're it will become a yeah. force to be reckoned with well and especially because uh people are discuss people who've been into this text or wanting to be into this text for some time are following along with it and uh uh me panther 3125 says capital mondays is how i spend my mondays time energy i think that's amazing uh he said i'm no scholar but i think that heinrich's thesis is that marx's labor theory of value is not fully fleshed out or understood until volume three i haven't gotten to chapter seven of his introduction to yet where he claims that he explains the actual exchange relationships 
in no way correspond to the amount of labor expended in production. I want to know more about that. Uh, Lark Ohio says that we should, he said, please do not stop. Like he wants us to keep going with this. Uh, me Panther gave a bunch of other really, um, in depth and thoughtful comments. Um, and NF are you eight on says, I'm currently beginning to find that I don't really buy what I think I understand as labor theory of value. Um, somewhere after minute 30, y'all clarify, quoting Mark, something like the substance of value is the labor as objectified and the form of labor is something else. And then say, ah, so value is distinct from exchange value. And that feels weird. Um, then this person says, it doesn't feel weird to me that exchange value is distinct from value given that separation outlined above, but the idea that value is basically the labor that goes into generating the product and its value is dot, dot, dot. I don't know if I agree with that. I don't read. I'm trying to get into the habit. Think I need to read slash engage with this idea of value equals labor that considers counters the idea that the value of a thing comes from its usefulness. That's how we feel. That's how we feel. Uh, you know, we're not going to be like, oh yeah, we are the readers. We're trying and that's the point. And, you know, we, we must be on the right track because Daniel Garner has very high standards for uh, what reading even is. That's Daniel Garner of OG Rose. And when he was watching this, his takeaway was no one else on the internet is doing this. We're going so hard, holding ourselves to great standards. And he's very excited about to see or to see where it goes. Right. Like well, something like that. Right, Nance? Yeah, it it uh, it was it was nice to have uh, his glowing review um, of of this what we're doing. Like in, in a way, this feels like kind of the thing to do. Um, but to hear him kind of like say, "No, it's not." Maybe it is the thing to do, but it's definitely not the thing that is being done. Um, which is cool he does have very high standards um and it's cool to get get that feedback but also like no uh everyone should fucking should do this or something like this do this version of of whatever it is you're actually like engaged in that's not to say like oh if you don't read books then fuck you you're you know you suck um but whatever project it is that you're actively engaged in in your life you should go hard and you should like exhaust um all options of of like understanding uh whatever it is you're trying to understand so it is cool to have like that affirmation that we are not just pissing into the wind here um but then again i i mean everyone is always doing nothing but pissing into the wind and screaming into the void but when we can do it together, that's what makes it worthwhile. It is weird, though, that delayed. <laughs> What's that? I said delayed reaction. Yes. <laughs> I was like <laughs> trying to get my tea set up. Yeah. What were you going to say? <laughs> No, it, it, it is weird that it's like a weird thing. Like the publishing industry is definitely not at its peak, but it's still like a, like a thing, right? Like an official industry. Um, like it, there's pomp and there's, you know, gatekeepers and there's propriety and there's, proper ways to get things done. And there's this like, um, recognition that comes along with being an academic and being one who reads and blah, 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 and all these things. But for it to be so weird to actually sit down and carefully read texts, right? Like it's a weird thing. Um, Dude, people like, don't do that. People, people just chew through books and spit them out and, and that's I, kind of it. I really think that they could take a lesson from the video game industry. I really think that they there should be a books 
category on Twitch. There should be an audible category on Twitch. And, uh, I mean, Twitch is owned by Amazon. Audible is owned by Amazon. Uh, in the same way that there are video gamers who just like make a life reading certain or playing certain kinds of games, we reading certain kinds of books and talking about them and making it, you know, not just reading it like an audiobook, but actually doing like this extra thing that we're adding. Um, that can't be done by anybody that actually requires a whole set of skills that most people don't have. Uh, if we have a talent for it, if we have a, a calling towards it, why aren't we sponsored? Why is this not a thing? Um, and so I don't know. I, I, I kind of am excited about the prospects of it becoming a thing. Um, and I think that like, yeah, it's right now, for instance, there is no category for this stuff. I have this on Twitch as politics and war. And I think that's an actual game. I don't think that that's <laughs> <laughs> like there, there, there is a politics uh, category, but I chose not to go with that one because the kinds of people who come around for that one in particular, they just want to call you, oh, communist, oh, you're faggot, blah, 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 you know, and it's just like, cool, man, whatever. But also, I, I'm sorry, I, I wish that we had like a books category on Twitch. Yeah, and, uh, no, dude, like I would have fucking killed like working, driving all day or working in a shop all day, welding and hammering. Like I would have fucking killed to have access to this type of content. Like I really, I wouldn't literally wouldn't have killed, but like, <laughs> like I was craving, I was so hungry for this shit when I was at work all day long. Like, and it just, it, it's, it doesn't exist. The, what passes for, um, I don't know, this type of content. I, I don't know, the wistful person, like try, like seeking out something. I, I, there's not even a name for it. Like that's how un, I, I don't know, marketed it is. Um, but I do think, I do think there's a need for it. If not a market demand for it, um, there's a human need a human for it. Need. I definitely and think there like like think about the fact that back in the age of dvds there were uh special add-ons or special editions where you could get like certain people maybe the director maybe some actors maybe some critics like doing their own uh like what was it like they, they dub over over the actual movie you can turn the that commentary on yeah the commentary they, where they would actually sit and like like deconstruct and analyze and add on. Um, yeah. Why yeah, dude. This, and why, people paid why? extra for it. Yeah. You paid extra why for the, it? for the special features. And right, right now it's like the people who read certain kinds of books are reading those certain kinds of books. X percentage more per year are added to the pool of people who read those kinds of books and as well as X percentage of people who read those kinds of books die off every year. And so there is this sort of, I don't know if it's on the constant decline. I don't know if it's seeing like a slow and steady, like uh rise. I don't, I have no idea what the statistics are, but I just have to imagine that the rise or decline is not extreme that for the most part, the marketing demographics or lifestyle consumers of certain kinds of media are more or less locked in. And what we're talking about from purely capitalistic terms is like a way to greatly expand. Um, and it's like, you're, it's like Amazon's just sitting here. Here's <laughs> over here is Twitch over here is audible. And then over here is like their actual books on Amazon. And it's just like all three of those could be feeding into each other because I think that there's like this idea that if you if you listen to some people reading a book, then you wouldn't get the book yourself. It's bullshit. Everyone knows you want to hold it in your hand. Like the more I read any of these books, the more I want to actually be able to hold it in my hand. If you see someone that you relate to uh, playing a video game, then you want that video game. And so it's just like at a very basic level, it's just like, oh yeah, it's like, oh, now I want that. Look, I see that person has that. Now I want that desire is desire of the other. Um, 
why wouldn't it work the same way with books? And so we're talking about getting new people into reading. We're talking about an intellectual uh, blossoming. And also, I just, I did that whole thing. Amazon, they own Twitch, they own Audible, and then they sell books on their platform. That's how they came about in the first place. Yeah. Um, also, I already worked there. I'm over here on the fourth thing. And so it's like, right. they could just take me from where I am at Amazon, put me into like a virtual or actual studio and then just pay me to do that instead of <laughs> listening, you know, sneaking books through my earbuds at my job. I don't know. I just think it makes sense. Well, that's, that's the thing, man. Like market logic doesn't, doesn't address need. People talk about innovation and people talk about like, Oh yeah, it's the greatest time to be alive. And, and like, no, these so-called innovators aren't doing anything, but reacting to either actual trends or imagined trends, trends that they imagine in their fucking boardrooms and in their development meetings. And because they, they dominate the market, what's available, those like what's in their imagination becomes actualized, like in the market, which is why, you know, commodities purchase their consumers, not the other way around. You can't go buy anything you want. You can only buy things that are being currently marketed and sold. And if, if you limit yourself based on what is available, you're going to fucking suck. You're going to be a boring, lazy, ineffective person. But if you allow yourself to be like, no, that is something I want. And you go, you figure out a way to go take it for yourself. Then you can pull yourself up by your non-existent bootstraps or just say, fuck it. I refuse. I refuse this. I'm, I'm going to fucking beat my head against the wall and I'm going to get what I want or I'm going to die trying. But you can't always do that. Right. And, th and that comes back to like structural fucking issues, material conditions and this and that. And we are fucking lucky enough to have the, uh, relative liberties that we do have, which is why I think it's awesome that we're actually trying to do something with it instead of sitting around eating Cheetos and ice cream. But to all the people who are just sitting around eating Cheetos and ice cream while listening to this, I'm stoked that it is helping you reprogram your desire. You, you are reprogramming yeah. your desire and maybe it'll take a long time and maybe it'll kick in really fast. Depends how your drive develops in accordance with this. But the fact is, is welcome. We're getting to it. Uh, I think we have like two hours to read here, uh, which is plenty for uh, for now. Next Monday, we'll be able to go a lot longer. And so we'll definitely get this finished out next Monday. But for now, let's get into it. Uh, Nance, if you want to start, I'll just be sitting here taking notes. Nice. The next paragraph is important for the key controversial issue of whether the magnitude of value is determined in production alone or also in exchange. It is a transition paragraph from Marx's derivation of objectified homogeneous human labor as the substance of value in the previous pages to a discussion of the determination of the magnitude of value by socially necessary labor time in the rest of section one. In this paragraph, Marx briefly restates his previous conclusion and then previews his later derivation in section three of money as the necessary form of appearance of value. And he notes that we must first consider the nature of value and in particular the magnitude of value independently of its form of appearance as exchange value. And this is the paragraph, the common factor in the exchange relation or in the exchange value of the commodity is therefore its value. The progress of our investigation will bring us back to exchange value as the necessary mode of expression or form of appearance of value. For the present, however, we must first consider the nature of value independently of its form of appearance. And that would be page 128 of Capital. I'm looking for it on that page and having trouble coming up with it. But if this is so important, I definitely want to yeah. get this one super, super underlined. It looks like there'll be another quote on the following page as well. Do you see where it is? The common factor. 
Yeah. Oh, it's the bottom. The, it's the bottom. The ha- last yeah, half. Yeah, it's the of second the half of the bottom paragraph. The common factor um, in the exchange relation or in the exchange value of the commodity is therefore its value. The progress of the investigation will lead us back to exchange value as the necessary mode of expression or form of appearance of value. For the present, however, we must consider the nature of value independently of its form of appearance. All right. So, so th- in our notes on actual on capital, um, we took a large quote from this page. We we actually grabbed that paragraph and put it into our own notes. And then I think progress of the investigation will lead us back to exchange value. So our addition was Marx allows different types of value, but here he is stating that exchange value and value used without qualifiers are the same thing. Yeah. So I, and we, I think we, it, it, the only thing I would want to add to that now is yeah. just, you know, are for the most part, the same thing I would, I would. Yeah, that was, that was our big, uh, realization. I think last time it was like, uh, yeah, yeah no, he's F. So he's saying the, the necessary form of expression or appearance is, yep. but, and that's we're it, going the to, form of appearance. That's it. Appearance and essence, right? All right, let's what's, uh, the, what's the point about what's the point about essence there? Um he's he's just he's like uh it's it's not it, it would be almost to say that it like it it can't be expressed. Um it's intangible. It's it's numinous um in its essence and so in its appearance it's like already changed like it's it's already not what it actually is in this necessary form of appearance because it's essence like like just wouldn't mostly agree though and say that value as it appears in exchange value is not it's not uh value like value, you know, it takes well, on I, this necessary form of, ex, of of appearance. But but here Marx is going to get to the real kind of value, and that's why he's going to get into this labor theory stuff. That's what which on that's what I page he like, gets into it right. Yeah, that's that's what I've been trying to pin down Mosley on. Like, of course he of course he gets that, but then he just goes and puts him like paints himself back into the same corner with this whole labor theory value thing. Like, I don't know. Like being, Oh, let's continue. We will also see in the following pages of section one, that the magnitude of value is also determined independently of the exchange process and is instead exclusively determined in the production process. See there exclusively determined. That's where he paints himself into a corner. Yeah. On the next page, Marx defines the magnitude of the value of a commodity as the quantity of objectified labor time contained in the commodity measured in hours, days, etc. I'm going to, I'm going to read this quote, but I'm going to read the whole paragraph. So it's the very, this is the part that directly follows from the last quote, which was one about, how he's not going to focus on its appearance or expression, but he's going to talk about uh, the nature of value independent from that mode of appearance. So then he starts out 129 with a use value or useful article, therefore has value only because abstract human labor is objectified or materialized in it. How then is the magnitude of this value to be measured by means of the quantity of the value forming substance the labor contained in the article. Okay. This quantity is measured by its duration and the labor time is necessary itself measured on the particular scale of hours, days, etc. See, this is him building down the page in the middle of this page. He, he brings in socially necessary labor time. 
is the labor time required to produce any use value under the conditions of production normal for a given society and with the average degree of skill and intensity of labor prevalent in the society. Yeah. And so this is, this is where it's like, yeah, no, this is straight up just Ricardo. Uh, mm -hmm. though I think that the addition is the addition and correction bringing in socially necessary labor time. Yeah. Yeah. And Being, so, yeah. Where it's, where it's, it's made fungible. It's made interchangeable. It's made lowest common denominator. Like that's the innovation, right? Um, I believe but so. Yeah. Like that's not the innovation. Like that's just Marx exposing the logic. Like that's Marx's innovation. He's exposing. He's not like, I don't, it's, I don't know, man. I find it difficult to believe that Mosley holds to that. But so far, I, I see nothing but that. Yeah, no, this has been very clear that he holds to reading. No, but also, I think, so you, I, you say it's difficult to, 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 to believe it or see it. I, I think it's very, no, it's just right here on the page. You just read Marx. Well, that's, this is uh, okay. what he's saying. Marx sure makes it I'm sound surprised. like he's a, Marx, Here's here's what I'm surprised by. I keep thinking about this for the last couple of weeks. If Marx is as the value form theorists are saying, then why doesn't Marx ever just make it really clear? Like he does get to where he basically says the stuff about it being brought into relation with everything else. And that's where its value comes in and blah, blah, blah. Like the exchange value comes in, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, why doesn't he ever just say the labor theory of value is bullshit and is the problem? Like he never actually says that. I he think it's pretty that. clear. Like I think the value form is is pretty clear. But I I mean I'm probably projecting that onto Marx. Like like because I'm already bringing that to Marx. But it seems pretty evident to me. I am surprised that there are there, there sure do seem to be a lot of people who hold to this naive labor theory of value. Um, that surprises me. Yeah, and, and by naive labor theory of value, you're not talking about the idea that literally the amount of time that you work is then, a, you know, materializes no, I'm talking, in the commodity. Yeah. You're talking about... As Marx is laying it out with this, so, you know, socially necessary labor time, like I that to me doesn't even like that's not what Marx is doing. Marx is exposing that and saying like this is pulling us this has grabbed us by the genitalia and it's leading us all around like a bunch of ignorant donkeys. And the, for people to to continue to reify that to to me is surprising cuz it seems pretty clear to me now again I am biased and I am probably projecting that onto it. Um But maybe I'm not. I don't know because the the people I know, the people that we've actually had one on one conversations about this with, all seem to be on the same page. When we've actually been able to have the conversation and take it, the you know, take it the distance, we all come out like, yeah, 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 we're right about this, and it's all here. So maybe we're all crazy. I don't know. I'm. I'm. I'm 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 not sold yet that Marx is so deliberately um saying what we think he's saying. I I do think he's saying it, but I'm also not so sure how deliberate he, he is about it. Um like he he never says socially necessary labor time our belief in socially necessary labor time is the problem. He never says he never says, he never says socially necessary labor time is the phantom. It is the thing that makes it so that the value form becomes dominated by exchange. He never says it is the thing that reduces everything and everybody to this fucking, I, uh, but he, okay. He never says it in those words, but he does say that this process, like this phantom does reduce everything and does ultimately devalue again, not in these words, like he says, the process, he doesn't call it out, I guess, in, in 42 point bold font, but <laughs> no, it's, but that's, 
But that's what it would have I mean, taken it's... for Kotsky and Lennon and <laughs> Angles to get the memo. It's like I, I I feel like to me it's just kind of crazy that like he's over here just saying it, like spelling it out, and then all of his fellow travelers are like, ah, yes, you've slightly adjusted Ricardo. Let's run with that. <laughs> yeah. And then Schumpeter's like, yes, he's just petite Ricardo. Dumb. Cringe. Like it's it's like it's his own damn fault that's what i'm saying as a writer yeah you yeah be all, you yeah, yeah, be all yeah careful to like it's it's same thing goes for uh for hegel on dialectics it's like dude you gotta at least spell that shit out sometimes just like give it the dude. short form punchy clickbaity you know overly simplified you got to do it sometimes yeah. reading this yeah marx is definitely not the best writer in the world <laughs> like I agree with you that he could he could have done a lot better. Well, and then the other but, thing is is that in 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 capital he really is also thinking, and that he is thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Him. And and he and and so uh, that that you know collected works that you were just holding is uh, according to Michal Heinrich uh, a heavily uh, doctored. Um, Set it's of it's anglicized or it's anglicized, an, not an, anglicized, very, but anglicized. Very anglicized, and we probably have Kotsky's and Bernstein's fingerprints all over it too, right? It's it, yeah, as well as potentially people in the Soviet Union, uh, because yep. I believe that the collected works as we know them were first put together in the Soviet Union. I don't know what phase of the Soviet Union this was done, but it's all sus. It's all sus. Anyway. It's good though. It's good. Um, so for folks who are like just tuning in or, or whatever, look, this is the, the, the basic idea is the socially necessary labor time is the correction to the labor theory of value, which is to say, um, when I look at something and I say, ah, yes, this has value and it makes sense that this is a dollar 50 or that this is 75 cents. It makes sense that it's 75 cents. Why? Because I work a certain amount of time. It just, it, we do like this thought experiment that, oh, human labor was put into this. I put human labor into other things. Those things get exchanged. Money is the currency that allows that to happen. So we, you know, it seems to make sense to us. Um, but also this naive, there is a vulgar form of the labor theory value that would just say that as Mark says right here on page 129, uh, Therefore, it would seem to be the more valuable, the more unskillful and lazy the worker who produced it. Because like uh, someone who takes 50 hours to do something, well, it's worth 50 hours, right? That means it's worth more, right? And the point is, no. Um, he says, the labor that forms the substance of value is equal human labor. The substance. So we're talking about the substance of value instead of the appearance of value. The, the substance of value versus the appearance of value. The appearance of value is that everything's exchangeable via money. The substance of the value is socially necessary labor time. But there's like this tendency on the left to then idealize socially necessary labor time and say that's what we have to get back to. And what the value form guys are saying is, no, it's not something to get back to. It's as bullshit as the, the expression, both the, both the substance of value and the expression of value are both bullshit. And I think that that might actually answer the question about like the difference between value itself and then uh use or exchange. And that would just be right. that uh, you, 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 you draw a line you write use on the top, you write exchange on the bottom or vice versa, it doesn't matter. And then you say, these are two sides of value. The point is we're critiquing value, not just one side of it. Both its substance and its expression is the, should be the problem here. So, okay, all right. Um, I, that's enough for me to write some notes about this as you keep going. Nice. Note that the magnitude of value is a distinct quantity of objectified labor contained in each commodity, 
and thus is an intrinsic property of each commodity, again, contrary to Bailey. In the next paragraph, Marx clarified that the magnitude of value, the quantity of objectified homogeneous or equal human labor contained in commodities, is not determined by the actual hours of concrete labor of an individual worker, but is instead determined by the social average quantity of labor time required to produce each commodity, measured in identical units of equal homogeneous labor. And that's, again, the lowest common denominator. Another quote from Marx, same page. However, the labor that forms the substance of value is equal human labor. The expenditure of identical human labor power, the total labor power of society, which is manifest in the values of the world of commodities, counts here as one homogeneous mass of labor power. Although composed of innumerable individual units of labor power, each of these units is the same as any other to the extent that it has the character of a socially average unit of labor power and acts as such. That is, only needs in order to only needs in order to produce a commodity, the labor time which is necessary on an average, or in other words, is socially necessary. Marx. Capital Volume 1, Chapter 1, page 129. In the postface to the second German edition of Volume 1, Marx states that one of the main changes in the second edition is that the connection between the substance of value and the determination of the magnitude of value by the labor time socially necessary, which was only alluded to in the first edition, is now expressly emphasized. That's 94, that would be in the forward or the introduction of the second edition. As part of this increased emphasis, the three sentences just quoted on the connection between the substance of value, objectified homogeneous human labor, and the magnitude of value, quantity of objectified homogeneous human labor, were added to the second edition. Yeah, so that was pulled from the preface to the second edition. Yeah, or the it post is. Phase, it, the post phase to the second German edition. For what we're using here, which is this Penguin edition, uh, it is page 94. And I'll just yep. read it. He says in chapter one, section one, the, de the derivation of value by analysis of the equations in which every exchange value is expressed has been carried out with greater scientific strictness. Similarly, the connection between the substance of value and the determination of the magnitude of value, that's just the price. Well, goddamn, I always say the price, but no, it's the amount of value by the labor time socially necessary, which was only alluded to in the first edition is now expressly emphasized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That doesn't change anything. I, I'm so triggered every time. It, it's like, okay, even if Mosley's right, this isn't the way to write this, right? This isn't, this doesn't, that doesn't debunk anything Heinrich's saying. Every, he keeps acting like these are gotchas. None of them are gotchas. That's what's annoying about it. It's only a gotcha if the person hasn't seriously read or engaged with Heinrich. Yeah, dude. And again, going back to like if Mosley were more keen on, I don't know, actually presenting an argument to, to people who weren't already convinced, he would have started out like, hey, this is what, like, this is Heinrich's stance and right. doing the steel man, right? And laying it all out. But instead, he's, He's doing this. He's putting all his cards out on the table and he doesn't have a great hand. And then he's like bopping us on the head for saying, well, I think I have a better hand than you. He's just bopping us on the head and saying, sit down, you little bitch. Like, I don't want to play with you, Mosley. You're not fun. I'm taking my Pokemon and I'm leaving. <laughs> Okay. And Marx calls this social average quantity of labor time measured in identical units, socially necessary labor time. Another quote again from page 129. Socially necessary labor time is the labor time required to produce any use value under the conditions of production normal for a given society and with the average degree of skill and intensity of labor prevalent in that society. Note that this definition of socially necessary labor time applies to any commodity. 
to each and every individual commodity the average labor time necessary to produce it. Nothing is said about exchange and demand as determinant of socially necessary labor time. Socially necessary labor time is determined entirely by the conditions of production normal in a given society. And I mean, Mosey's right about that. On page 129, it does say that. But, you know, a couple sections later in, in the same chapter, Marx goes on to fucking whatever. In the next paragraph, <laughs> dude, Marx dude. makes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, dude. Come on. I know. It's just like, we know. We know. We've already been through this. And? And? It's, it's like, he, it's like, like, I don't know, dude. It's, it's very, it's, it's like Mosley, and I'm not I, trying to say anything. I don't know. Anyway. This is coming off very flat, very one dimensional, very like very superficial, very concerned with appearances. It seems like Mosley doesn't care about the overall concept Marx is laying out. And I, I mean, to call it an, an overall concept, like the the project, right? That you know manifested itself in in the three volumes of capital like it it's it's like mosley isn't interested in grappling with that he is only interested in it's almost like he's trying to like debunk something claim by claim like it's it's it feels like mosley is disingenuous disingenuously engaging with an with a debate opponent and he's like well i'm just going to come here and debunk you point by point and i'm not going to give your argument time to develop i'm not going to like i used to love to watch bob ross paint right because mm -hmm. like you get stoned on a saturday morning and there's just this cool dude and he's like in in a half an hour on pbs he just creates this beautiful work of art and at the end of it, you're like, that was amazing. But in the beginning, it's just a blank canvas. And throughout the stages of the development of the work of art, sometimes it looks like shit. And you're like, Bob, what are you doing, dude? That looks stupid. That's a blob and a line and a squiggly. That looks like shit. And then you're like on tenter hooks and you're like, oh, he fucked up. How's he going to pull it together? But then because Bob Ross was a master at his craft, he does some weird things that you can't really understand unless you've put the time in painting, practicing, understanding the craft that is painting. But by the end of it, there's a beautiful painting that has developed and it is an object. It's a thing in itself. This painting that Bob Ross created, it's not a thing in itself, but you know, like, you, you know, like that's what capital is, right? It's this thing that develops over time. And Marx is, is doing this developmental structured process of laying it out. And Mosley is like, oh shit, Bob, you fucked it up. I'm going to change the channel. He doesn't care about the end result. That's what it feels like when I'm reading Mosley. It's also like reading like this, this, uh, it, it's kind of like, I don't know, like when you're, when you're arguing with like some, uh, some sort of like positivist who's like never been introduced yeah. to die to dialectics who's just like well you look here on the page you see what it says and you look here on this page and you see what it says and there's no like okay there's no like getting into the shoes of the interpretation you're trying to take on like like that's where it's just like he hasn't like put on the position and actually like tried to see the text through that he instead he was like oh that's what he says well check this out I'm going to go tell you exactly what I already know. And it's like, yeah, but you've, you've not tried to read the text in, in light of this and you've not followed its arguments already. You've not. So it's like, instead of like following Heinrich through and then thinking about it and then coming back to his position, which is, I think just good reading. He's just been like, Oh, doesn't comply with what I think already. Check it out. Here's why I think what I think already Look at what it says right here. Look at what it says right here. And it's like, you're, 
it's like cherry picked. It's not like the whole you're missing yep. the totality. Like that's like Heidegger and Marx, uh, like these thinkers or Hegel as well. They cannot just be, you can't just pick out like a thing they said. We'll see what they said here. Okay. But how does that fit into their overarching project? You know? Yeah. Anyway, but I look forward to seeing what he's going to do in this chapter on Heinrich. I don't know if we'll get to it today, but let's try. Let's let's see if we can get there. Let's yeah, go. yeah, yeah. I'm in the next paragraph, I'm dying to know. In the next paragraph, Marx makes this point even stronger and concludes that the magnitude of the value of each commodity is exclusively determined by the quantity of socially necessary labor time required to produce the commodity. Once again, page 129, what exclusively determines the magnitude of the value of any article is therefore the amount of labor socially necessary or the labor time socially necessary for its production. And I just, I don't know, we keep kind of going off on tangents, but Marx very clearly states, for the sake of this chapter, at least, he is using value as exchange value. Um... Well, hold on. I, on the previous pre page, he just said we're going to bracket that out, though. That's right. not this. <laughs> so on the previous page, he just said, um, I'll, I will read it. Um, the progress of the investigation will lead us back to exchange value as the necessary mode of expression or form of appearance of value. For the present, however, we must consider the nature of value independently of its form of appearance which would imply that he is bracketing out any consideration of exchange value, which he will bring back in like five yeah. pages. So yeah. for, the, for the moment, when you're reading the next page, 129, he has suspended that shit, literally. And Mosley, hold on, scroll up. Did Mosley not just quote that? He did. Mosley just quoted that himself. No, I think it's higher up. Uh, it's 128. So like, uh, where's 120? Where was where? Oh, uh, it was on page. It's on page 14. It's it's this yeah. one. So there you go. He the common factor in the exchange. Really, yeah. So, so for the present, however, we must first consider the nature of value independently of its form of appearance. Okay, Mosley, you're literally <laughs> quoting him on the previous page, saying he will bracket out. It's it's form of expression. So if we bra so th what that means is we're going to assume that that doesn't factor in, and now we're looking at the exclusive uh, way that socially necessary labor time de uh, determines the substance of value. That's all we're looking at. But that's so we're thinking about something lopsided here. Okay, I'm gonna fucking. I wish I had. My, I could easily work my whiteboard right now but uh, outside of being able to do that here i'm just going to do it like this so 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 here's use does this does this work everyone can see that right okay here's use and here's exchange okay now the circle it looks like a pokeball the circle has a line through it the top says exchange the bottom says use what Marx just said he's going to do on page 128 is he's going to bracket out exchange. He's literally saying, I'm not going to talk about exchange. I'm just going to talk about use and hold on. Let me write S L uh, S square L socially necessary labor time. All right. He's like, how does socially necessary labor time determine the circle? Now the circle is what it's value. So, you know, in this moment, because you were going back to saying, oh, well, when he says value, he means exchange. No, but he just said he doesn't on this page. So just for this page, right. he's saying that he doesn't mean that. He just means how does socially necessary labor time determine the value in terms of use value alone, which, of course, the commodity is both of these things. And he has literally told us on the goddamn quote that Mosley just read to us that he's bracketing out exchange. So to me, it's just like, well, there's and, nothing more blazingly uh, undialectical than being able to follow through. Like, what is he saying on this page? How does that relate to this page? Oh, okay, I want to use a quote on this page to serve my argument. Okay, but how does what he's saying on this page 
fit into what he's doing in the chapter and how does that chapter fit into his project that's that's just being left out yeah and marx goes hard to highlight the the dual the dual nature of the commodity the dual nature of value the use and exchange like marx is constantly right. hammering on that and then when he says like hey we're going to bracket out this this half of the pokeball and deal with this half um to then totalize the bottom half and say it's the whole thing is is silly which is what is surprising like which is why i have been surprised reading mosley like i it's surprising I keep, I keep going back to no 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 we got to give him more credit than that and then yeah, the I'm, end, it, I'm like it's making me feel dumb it's making me doubt myself which is a good thing but it's making me doubt myself more than usual which is not a good thing you already doubt yourself so much now you're just so yeah fuck guys um this is fun all right let's let's keep going okay Note again that each commodity, any article, has a distinct magnitude of value, which is determined by the labor time socially necessary for its production. And again, nothing is said about exchange and demand as a determinant of the magnitude of value. Exclusively determines means that there is no other determinant of the magnitude of value besides the normal average labor time socially necessary for its production. In particular, the relation between supply and demand in exchange is not mentioned as a determinant of the magnitude of value and is implicitly excluded. I just want to say, dude, we spent a whole day finagling over supply and demand and how, how it relates to not just price, but also value um the magnitude the magnitude of value yeah the magnitude of value and that's in chapter one of course no but he doesn't call it supply and demand he just calls it like the relations of exchange or some shit like that right like the right well and to to say just it's not just supply and demand right it's also sign value and marx doesn't explicitly say sign value but i don't like i don't think sign value contradicts uh exchange value at all right i, I think it's an add-on pack or a dlc or whatever like um but yeah like we we spent a whole day dealing with for the most part supply and demand and how it it affects exchange value um come on mosley i know you're better than this dude in the next two pages marx discusses the important quantitative implication that since the magnitude of the value of any commodity is exclusively determined by the labor time required to produce it the magnitude of value of a commodity will change if and only if the socially necessary labor time required to produce it changes. Only if the productivity of labor changes and the magnitude of value varies inversely with the productivity of labor. Dude. Okay. From 130. The quote, the value of a commodity would therefore remain constant if the labor time required for its production also remained constant, but the latter changes with every variation in the productivity of labor. And a quote from 131, the value of a commodity therefore varies directly as the quantity and inversely as the productivity of the labor which finds its realization within the commodity. Following this last sentence, the GDR editors of volume 23 of the Marx Engels Werk added in parentheses an important summary and preview that was in the first edition of volume one, but not in the later German editions and was included in the 1977 vintage English translation. Now we know the substance of value. It is labor. We know the measure of its magnitude. It is labor time. The form, which stamps value as exchange value, remains to be analyzed. But before we do this, we need to develop the characteristics we have already found somewhat more fully. And that's 131. That's, 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 a, that's the second time, though. That's the second time Marx is making clear that he has bracketed out exchange value in this in these yeah, pages. He's, he's saying, we'll get to that later, guys. For now, we're not... That's why, that's why, that's why I'm like, I do feel like 
like, no, no, this can't be right, dude. This can't be the book you wrote, Mosley, because it's, I mean, it's, it's all there, dude. It's all right there, dude. It's, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's happening. Fuck, man. I mean, the, the whole... The whole fucking section... <laughs> on money. On money. On the money form. That whole section was talking... about how the value of a commodity can fluctuate with more than just the socially necessary labor time. The whole, the bulk of chapter one, maybe not the bulk, but the whole like maybe last 15, 20 pages of chapter one are dealing with these other fluctuations that aren't just socially necessary labor time. I don't know, man. Yeah, like, um, like he says on page 141, if we say that his values, commodities are simply congealed quantities of human labor, our analysis reduces mm -hmm. them. It is true to the level of abstract value, but does not give them a form of value distinct from their natural forms. It is otherwise in the value relation of one commodity to another. So it's like, he's basically saying, yeah, if we're talking about something merely as a useful thing, but then it's not really a commodity because a, a commodity proper is in relation to other commodities. It, it's not a commodity until it's in relation to other exactly. commodities. Exactly. It's just a thing. It's just a use value. It's not an actual fucking commodity until it's in this other interrelated web of this social web of other use values. That's what makes it a commodity. It becomes value in its coagulated state in objective form. The value of the linen as a congealed mass of human labor can be expressed only as an objectivity, a thing which is materially different from the linen itself and yet cannot to the linen and yet common to the linen and all other commodities. The problem is already solved. So, so yeah, the, the, I don't, we're, I'm looking for the page though, where, remember with the first time we we're reading through this, we're like, oh yeah, it's like 12 pages in or whatever. Like, remember we were like 15 pages in, seven pages in, like, where was it where he first the indicates? Dual, the dual nature or what? Not the, just the dual nature. Of course, everyone knows about the dual nature. I mean, like something that confirms the Heinrich reading. Um, and it's so early in that we were like slapping ourselves for the fact that we missed it the first time we actually read this. Um, It's just like, okay, the enigmatic character of the product of labor, as soon as it assumes a form of a commodity, rises from the form itself. Uh, yeah. The form, the form is the dual nature, and the top half of the Pokeball, the exchange side, is its relation to everything else. That, that the sole constituting value cannot just be socially necessary. Oh, I'm... Uh, I don't know. It seems, but it, but it, this is still not what I'm looking for. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We can keep going, because um, we'll come back to it in a more deliberate way. Yeah. Someone in the comment section uh, was like, "You guys need to read them more seriously, without uh, you know giving your uh, reactions and trying to put them back in your boxes like every page or whatever." It's like, um. This is literally the kind of content we're doing is react content. Now we're trying 
to do more than just react. We are trying to actually tease out these arguments. That's why we're going over this chapter again and again and reading different authors on this chapter. But if the dude's going to act like Marx is saying the sole determinant is this period, uh, social necessary labor time, period, uh, end of story, without like acknowledging the fact that he had just said we're bracketing out exchange value on the previous page, we're going to react. So anyway. Yeah. And let's see. I, dude, 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 that's a whole thing, though. That's a whole other rant. But it's like there's a kind of commenter who's like, oh, you're reacting. Why are you reacting? And it's like, you know, if someone says something stupid, we're supposed to internalize it. We're supposed to sit with it. We're not supposed to ever respond to anything. We're just supposed to be like a neutral TV producer or like, you know, mm. like uh, like our job is to be like Bill Maher or something like just you. We go off the teleprompter and we engage the generic peer. We can never get specific. We can never actually respond to anyone who actually says anything that people actually say. You know, it's like, OK, that's a weird that's a weird thing. Look, man, some people just have want, this need to talk shit. They want audio sections. They want audiobooks. I mean, of course they don't because then they just go listen to audiobooks and they wouldn't sit there and talk shit. Because there are go to Librivox, bitch. No, if you if you can't contain there. yourself, go to Librivox. <laughs> like we're this is different. Yeah. Come on. It's already there, guys. But no. Those like the and that's why they're not just staying on Librivox. That's why they're they're going elsewhere because they are looking for something else. And maybe they don't um admit that they're looking for something else, but they are looking for something else, and that's why this matters. And I don't know, man. Like if we suck that bad, do it yourself. Yeah, please do it yourself. Yeah. All right. I do have to say though. Our notes are impressive as fuck. And like for someone to say, oh, you guys are just like doing this, like, uh, I don't even know, spectacle thing. I, 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 th I think we're taking it pretty seriously. What would, what would the, uh, what would the, uh, last page, what, what, what should the note for the last page say? Um, I, it, it's, he's, um, He's just going hard on, on repeating socially necessary labor time. And that's yeah, it. Yeah, like yeah. he doesn't, he doesn't accept that, you know, co commodities are necessarily these social connections, this web of interrelated use and exchanges. And Mark's actually, yeah, that does come up very early where he's he's like the commodity or the the value is necessarily this thing that is social that comes out of the inner relationships it's in the first few pages exchange value appears first of all as a quantitative relation the proportion in which use values of one kind it exchange for use values of another kind this relation changes constantly with time and place hence exchange value appears to be something accidental and purely relative and consequently an intrinsic value i.e an exchange value that is inseparably connected with a commodity inherent in it seems a contradiction in terms let us consider the matter more closely um, and then uh, a boot for silk or gold it is exchanged for other commodities in the most diverse proportions Therefore, the wheat has many exchange values instead of one. Like, that's... I, I think that's pretty clearly saying that it's this social relationship, right? But he, it, it is more clear. I know it's more I, clear. I, I think the issue with this one is that he's using the word appears so much. And appears yeah, is yeah. practically a slur for, for a dialectician. So he's saying... Exchange value appears, first of all, as a quantitative relation, the proportion in which use values of one kind exchange for use values of another kind. This relation changes constantly with time and place. Hence, exchange value well, appears, thing. appears to be something accidental and purely relative. That's the thing. He like He's saying it's bullshit. He's saying from the very beginning, look, this is just a, a, a 
a mystical fetish that pops up from the process itself, like from the very beginning, he is doing that by saying over and over again, the appearance, the appearance, the appearance, and calling it this mysterious thing, right? This specter, this phantasm, all this, it's saying like, no, it's this contrived relationship. He is saying that from the very beginning, which is why it blows my mind where people want to do this thing where they like ontologize this value. It is nothing but an emergent fucking fetish. That could be true and mostly could still be right because he's... No, I... Because right here on this page, just going with what it actually says, he's just... So he had just in the previous paragraph talked about use value and then he says, oh, but there's also this other thing, exchange value. And then he goes, exchange value appears, blah, 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 blah. And you can say, yes, it is a fetish. Exchange value is bullshit. But that doesn't erase use value, and that still leaves room to say that social necessary labor time but did determine. To, but to force use value into this uh, quality of interchangeability necessitates the fetishization of it. So sure, use value, whatever, all day long, if you want to go work on a fucking farm and play with your use values, that's fine. I don't care, but your use values are not equal to my use values. And the moment you want to pretend that they are, you do this fucking foolish process. Um, and like, therefore there, there is no value that can be agreed upon by all people that would come from socially necessary time, socially necessary reproduction. Um, there can't be. If all you're dealing with is use values, there can't be. It does not work that way. The, the moment you need to have exchange values, you, you do this fucking process. And this process is the foolish process. And if Mosley wants to have this process, but also claim that you can always concretely tie it to socially necessary labor, you can't have that cake and eat it too. Because it is a social relationship, necessarily. But in, I mean, he is very clear multiple times in the first section or two of this chapter. Um, it might actually be at the beginning of, of section two where he is talking about the dual character. Only the products of mutually independent acts of labor performed in isolation can confront each other as commodities. To sum it up, useful labor, i.e. productivity, act, productive activity of a definite kind, carried on with a definite aim. Use values cannot confront each other as commodities, unless the useful labor contained in them is qualitatively different in each case. In a society whose products generally assume the form of commodities, in a society of commodity producers, this qualitative difference between the useful forms of labor which are carried on independently and privately by individual producers develops into a complex system, a social division of labor. I mean, that's pointing at it too. Sum up then, the use value of every commodity contains useful labor, productive activity of definite kind, carried on with a definite aim. This is 133. Um, use values cannot confront each other as commodities unless the useful labor contained in them is qualitatively different in each case. In a society whose products generally assume the form of commodities, that is, in a society of commodity producers, this qualitative difference between the useful forms of labor which are carried on independently and privately by individual producers, develops into a complex system, a social division of labor. Page, uh, page 133 is where Marx, Marx's issue is not with division of labor, but the form it takes in a society centered around commodity production. Page 134. 
Tailoring versus weaving, qualitatively different forms of labor are the precondition for exchange. There would be no exchange without this difference in quality. Page 135, simple average labor varies from region to region, age to age, but it is always an abstraction from the average. And page 135 is the first mention of fetishization. Page 136, valorization. Page 137, simple labor to the distinction between productivity itself and labor power. All right, I found it. Page 137? Nah, dude. Couple more. It's page 141. But why don't I have it heavily, heavily? underlined if it's right here so i have written down in the notes here the value of the thing only gets its value in relation to another commodity there against, it is that's it yep 141 against, against the labor theory of value commodities are not only quantities of congealed labor because this does not understand the value form they take on when in relation to one another okay so where on the page does it say that because that's what our notes say but where does it actually say that on page 141 bottom no, 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 no. I definitely do have a little line there, which I read off of earlier, which is if we say that as values, commodities are simply yep, congeal yep. Qual quantities of human labor, our analysis reduces them to true to the level of abstract value, but does not give them a form of value distinct from their natural forms. It is otherwise in the value relation of, it is otherwise in the value relation of one commodity to that's, another. The first That's what I have highlighted, yeah. The first it value. is otherwise in the value relation of one commodity to another. Yeah, so then it says the first commodity's value character emerges here through its own relation to the second commodity. This is, yep. this yeah, and this is following from that paragraph where he's using the uh, chemical substances example, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, where he says that if these substances are combined together in the same proportions in each case, um, moreover, these substances are combined together in the same proportions in each case, namely C4H8O2. If now butyric acid were to be equated with propyl formate, then in the first place, propyl formate would count in this relation only as a form of existence of CHO with those numbers. And in the second place, it would thereby be asserted that butyric acid also consists of this. Thus, by equating propyl formate with butyric acid, one would be expressing their chemical composition as opposed to their physical formation. What is he doing with this one? Do you remember what he's doing with this example? Um, he's talking about natural form, use value, and um, and exchange value. Yeah, where you're not concerned with just the natural form of these chemicals. Um, like you're concerned with the particularities and the unique qualities thus by equating propyl formate with butyric acid one would be expressing their chemical composition as opposed to their physical formation so, so he's using this about, example to demonstrate that they have they themselves have a dual character, right? It's the same thing, but it's they're not the same thing because they're composed of the physical relationship of the parts of themselves make them what they are, even though they have the same base materials. So it's a dual oh, character, like it's an illustration of dual dual character. Like All linen right, so, and cotton, like cotton right, and linen right, right. are the same physical substance, but they're, they're different. And th th that's a social relation.
How about you keep going um, now that we found that, and then I've got to go get something out of the oven, and uh, I'll get back to doing the notes. But this is this is good shit. I like Thanks. being for I like being forced to go because it's like we remembered that that page existed, but we didn't know where it is, and it's like we'll have to do it a few times. We'll have to recall it a few times before it comes easily, and before we could sit on a panel, say in London, with these books in front of us and go. You know, yeah. point at the page, you know. All right. Yeah. Section 1.2. Section 2. The dual character of labor in a commodity economy, abstract human labor, and concrete useful labor. Section 2 develops more fully the dual character of labor in a commodity economy that we, that were discussed in section one i believe that should be that was discussed in section one concrete useful labor and abstract human labor and abstract human labor is discussed in both of its states of existence both as living abstract human labor expended in production and as objectified abstract human labor embodied in commodities or as a lot of people like to say dead labor objectified labor the title of section two is in terms of objectified abstract human labor embodied in commodities, but the section is mainly about living abstract human labor in production, in contrast to the concrete useful character of the same labor in the same process of production, with tailoring and weaving as the main examples, the dual character of tailoring and weaving in production. Acts of exchange on the market are not mentioned at all in section two, except to say that one use value cannot be exchanged for another of the same kind on page 132. Section 2 begins as follows. And I'm not so sure about that. That's a tall order that Marx doesn't mention exchange at all in section 2. Um... Is section two Let's the one see. we were just in or the one we're going to? Um, oh, so that two. follows on. It section starts at the bottom of page 131. Section two? Section two starts at, at, yeah, section two starts at the bottom of page 131 and goes until one until the end of 137. Um, he says that it doesn't talk about exchange value at all. It's like literally the first sentence of section two. Yeah. And, well, he says, and, <laughs> let's just keep going, Mosley. <laughs> I don't know, man. So on 131, 132, Mark says, initially, the commodity appeared to us as an object with a dual character, possessing both use value and exchange value. Later on, it was seen that labor, too, has a dual character insofar as it finds its expression in value. It no longer possesses the same characteristics as when it is the creator of use values. Thus, the dual character of the labor that produces commodities corresponds to the dual character of the commodities discussed in section 1. The second sentence is about living abstract human labor in production. Labor that finds its expression in value is labor expended in production. The expression or the result of living labor in production is both the use value of commodities and the value of the commodities produced, and the latter is the objectified abstract human labor embodied in the commodities. Marx first discusses the character of concrete useful labor for two pages. And the main point is that the useful labor that produces use values is a condition of existence in all forms of society. Marx on page 133 says labor then as the creator of use values as useful labor is a condition of human existence, which is independent of all forms of society. It is an eternal natural necessity, which mediates the metabolism between man and nature and therefore human life itself and i think actually in our notes we say this is where marx transistoricizes labor yeah yeah that's true this page 133 we say marx ontologizes and transhistoricizes labor and this is where time energy comes in time energy is the precondition for labor time which is the precondition for labor power 
Um, so yes, taking this stance that labor mediates all human existence, no matter what. Um, and there, and there's nothing more primordial than labor, um, is in our view, a mistake, one that Marx makes and many other people. And then the remaining three pages of the section are about the character of abstract human labor, which is unique to a commodity economy, with tailoring and weaving as examples of labor activities in production. The main difference between abstract human labor and concrete useful labor is that, as concrete labor, tailoring and weaving are different kinds of labor activities. But as abstract human labor, tailoring and weaving are both considered a homogenous as are both considered as homogenous labor. The same kind of labor and expenditure of human muscles and brains, etc., in both tailoring and weaving. And again from Marx on page 134. As values, the coat and the linen have the same substance. They are the objective expressions of homogenous labor, but tailoring and weaving are qualitatively forms of labor. If we leave aside the determinate quality of productive activity, and therefore the useful character of the labor. What remains is the quality of being an expenditure of human labor power. Tailoring and weaving, although they are qualitatively different productive activities, are both a productive expenditure of human brains, muscles, nerves, hands, etc., and in this sense, both human labor power. These are merely two different forms of the expenditure of human labor power. And that is, uh, more lowest common denominator. Just, I think Marx was trying to like, trying to do something with labor. Um, but he should have just come up with something prior to labor instead of, instead of saying labor's it, it's the end all be all. He should have said, you know, human creativity isn't always labor. Because when you're talking about labor, labor power, labor time, you go to this socially necessary labor. You go to this lowest common denominator form of labor. Um, because of the commodity form, because of universal exchange and all this, like you have to take it there. Um, so in order to escape that, because ultimately that would lead you to nothing but workerism. Like if you're doing this thing where all we want to do is free up the fruits of our own labor. No, I don't want to free up the fruits of my own labor. I want to free up my time energy. Right. From labor, from labor, from labor itself. Um, and, and we're not utopians. We're not saying it can be done completely. We're just, we want to limit the sphere of heteronomy to what's socially what's actually socially necessary not use this That's, fictive mind fetish experiment to to measure everything we do against socially necessary labor time no some things are socially necessary but they belong in the realm of heteronymous labor separate that yeah. from everything else and yeah that sphere of necessity will persist and maybe we can shrink it down and we can get it as small as we can get it but it doesn't go away and that's the fucking problem where you want to do this labor theory of value, where you want to have this labor ontology. We want to shrink the sphere of socially necessary labor time reproduction. Like we're not going to escape that. We're not going to get away from it, but there is a world outside of it. And we want to be able to partake in the world outside of it. Um, so this, you know, this idea of value as, as, you know, universal exchange of universally exchangeable use value. Yeah, it's a thing. And, and it's a thing that we have to reckon with and contend with in this global social web of interrelationships that we all have and we all share and that we, and that is society. We live in a society, right? That's the thing. Um, but that shouldn't be what we like aspire to that that should just be that's the homework that's the chores that's what you have to do in order to that's the vegetables you have to eat before you get to eat your cake 
So I, I want to I want to tarry with this quote though that you just read. As values the coat and the linen are, they have the same substance. They are the objective expressions of homogeneous labor, but tailoring and weaving are qualitatively forms of labor. If we leave aside the determinate quality of productive activity and therefore the useful character of the labor, what remains is the quality of being an expenditure of human labor power. Tailoring and weaving, although they are qualitatively different, productive activities are both a productive expenditure of human brains, muscles, nerves. Okay, I just want to say at the end of uh, the last section, so uh, the beginning of the section that we are currently in, right, at this point, had he not already said... I believe that he had said that uh, we we're going to continue on bracketing exchange value. So, I mean, even even now, he's still just developing out a position, a position that is the bottom half of the Pokeball. He's not. So Mosley's still doing the same thing. Which is saying, oh, see what he said? He said it right here. This confirms what I'm saying. And it's like, yes, but we're still working within the span of pages where he bracketed what the commodity and its value um, really are all about. Like the commodities, yeah. it's determined by more than just this but he's he's saying for now we're just looking at this and he's and he's talking about it in the terms of the political economists who he's trying to do a critique of and a critique at the time meant an imminent one where you where you literally have to sit there and spell out their argument better than they can so he's over here steel manning them when he says tailoring yeah. and weaving, although they are qualitatively different productive activities, are both a productive expenditure of human brains, muscles, nerves, hands, etc., and in this sense, both human labor power, these are merely two different forms of the expenditure of human labor power. It's like, Moses like italicizing it to be like, see, see, he says that. And it's like, yeah, we know he says that, but he's literally bracketed this shit. And then he's like, when he said that section two won't get into exchange value, and I said, well, it says it on the first sentence. Yeah, this is the first sentence says, initially the commodity appeared to us as an object with a dual character possessing both the use value and exchange value. Later on, it was seen that labor two has a dual character insofar as it finds its expression in value. It no longer possesses the same characteristics as when it is the creator of use values. I was the first to point out and examine critically this twofold nature of the labor contained in commodities. At this point, is it is is crucial to an understanding of political. As this point is crucial to an understanding of political economy, it requires further elucidation. Meaning that all he's doing in this section is flushing out the not the dual character of the commodity, but the dual character of labor itself, uh, yeah. which is going to be what is this. The distinction between uh, w w what are the two kinds of uh, labor? Concrete productive about? labor and abstract. Yeah. And so he's doing this concrete abstract thing in this point. And he's like, yeah, so he, this is his innovation uh, that he's adding to. But, but he's still focused on the labor side. And he just said it. Yeah, this is where he's describing the how socially necessary labor like this is his this is where he's doing that like this is where he's laying out the difference between concrete productive labor that people want to cling on to and and you know that is true like it the dignity of work right like it feels good to be actually productive and be concretely productive. Yeah. Um, and then like objectified labor, dead labor is this flattened out lowest common denominator thing. Like that's where he's making this distinction.
It is important to note that Marx is talking about the dual character of labor in production, i.e. of the labor that produces commodities, productive activity. For example, the dual character of the labor activities of tailoring and weaving. I emphasize this because Heinrich argues that abstract labor does not exist in production, but only comes to exist in exchange. However, Marx's discussion of the dual character of labor in section 2 directly contradicts Heinrich's interpretation. I will return to this important point in the next chapter. He doesn't give you a citation there. No, and he's also doing the like pick it apart piece by piece instead of dealing with it on a whole. It's like It's important to talk about the dual char character of the labor in production. Uh, the, yeah, but he's talking about the dual character of labor in production in isolation from the exchange yeah. relation. With the exchange relation, bracketed. And then he says, for, for example, the dual character of the labor activities of tailoring and weaving. I emphasize this because Heinrich argues that abstract labor does not exist in production, but only comes to exist in exchange. Okay, it's a very strong... Very definitive statement. Where does Heinrich say it so clearly? This is what happened in the actual comment section of our very first video when someone was like, I don't go with Heinrich because Heinrich, he does this thing where he says that all the value in production goes away and then the only the only place the value comes from is in the exchange relation. That's what that commenter said. And I said, okay, but where does he actually say that? Cause I, it's just like, it, like that's an extreme. Like you're saying that it's all determined by exchange. It's like they're putting him on opposite yeah. day. Like, and it's just like, okay, well, well, if if he says it so clearly, then it should be really easy to give us a fucking quote. And and here you have Mosley. He's going to put a whole book out critiquing Heinrich. Heinrich's name is in the actual title, and here he says this, but he doesn't give us a fucking citation. The thing too, like. I don't see how socially necessary lowest common denominator labor. I don't see how that doesn't imply social relations anyway. I, I, I like to me that necessarily implies exchange and if not exchange like this, this interrelationship, this interdependent, this, this social relationship, the social relation that like, that's, that's not even implied. Like that's necessitated. Like we cannot think, a social average without thinking about equivalence. Right. Yeah. Right. Or, or abstraction. So, right. Which I don't know, which is a, another one of those points where I just like, I don't get when, when people are like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's bullshit. I don't know. That's when I start to feel really dumb. Because it's like, yeah, but, the, you know, C follows B. And you're talking about B. And you're over here positing B as if B is this thing. But C necessarily follows from B. <laughs> like, I don't know. All right. Marx then discusses further details about human labor as homogenous labor. He explains that the basic unit in terms of which quantities of human labor are measured is simple average labor. The labor power possessed by every ordinary person without being developed in any special way. And this simple average labor in any particular society is taken as given. More complex labor counts as a multiple of this basic unit of simple average labor. On page 135, Marx says, But the value of a commodity represents human labor pure and simple the expenditure of human labor in general. It, human labor, is the expenditure of simple labor power, i.e. of the labor power possessed in his bodily organism by every ordinary man, on the average, without being developed in any special way. Simple average labor in a particular society it is given. More complex labor counts only as intensified or rather multiplied simple labor so that a smaller quantity of complex labor is considered equal to a larger quantity of simple labor. 
And this paragraph concludes with the simplifying assumption that henceforth in this book, every other or every form of labor is viewed as simple labor. On 135 again, in the interests of simplification, we shall henceforth view every form of labor power directly as simple labor power. Let's see. Are you just looking at the so, the actual quote on one thirty five? Yeah, that is the very end. We shall yeah. have for view every form of labor power directly as simple labor power. By this, we shall simply be saving ourselves the trouble of making the reduction. Okay. Yeah, just whenever he talks about labor power, he's talking about um, this this sort of average um, lowest common denominator form of labor power. And then we just yeah. have to kind of imagine that there's like more uh, qualified forms of labor power, whatever. Sure. What what is he saying here though? What is that? What does he think that's doing for him? Like he's I'm not sure. Oh, he's just like. No. I think he's just trying to flesh out concrete and abstract labor and say, see, he has nothing to do with exchange. It's all labor, 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 abstract labor, abstract labor. Which is the section we're in. Yes. <laughs> Which is kind of like, yeah, so. Yeah, that's, dude. That's, 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 the that's why we came here, right? Yeah, that's what. It's it sa says that on the door. That's why I came in this office. Yeah. The next All paragraph right. elaborates the differences between concrete useful labor and abstract human labor. Just as in viewing the coat and the linen as values, we abstract from their different use values. So in the case of the labor represented by those values, do we disregard the difference between its useful forms, tailoring and weaving? The use values coat and linen are combinations of, on the other hand, productive activity with a definite purpose, and on the other, cloth and yarn. The values coat and linen, however, are merely congealed quantities of homogeneous labor. In the same way, the labor contained in these values does not count by virtue of its productive relation to cloth and yarn, but only as being an expenditure of human labor power. Tailing, tailoring and weaving are the formative elements in the use values, coat and linen, precisely because these two kinds of labor are of different qualities, but only insofar as abstraction is made from their particular qualities, only insofar as both possess the same quality of being human labor, the tailoring and weaving form the substance of the values of the two articles mentioned. That's 135 through 136. Yeah, he's just doing more abstract labor, abstract labor, abstract labor. The points made in this important passage may be summarized as follows. The first, in viewing the coat and the linen as values, we disregard the differences between the productive activities of tailoring and weaving. The second, the values contained in the coat and the linen are congealed qu quantities of homogeneous labor which suggests that they are congealed from the fluid state of homogeneous labor that has been expended in production. And the third, tailoring and weaving produce value in production because they both possess the property of being expenditures of homogeneous human labor, which abstracts from their particular qualities. The objectified homogeneous human labor contained in the coat and linen is, metaphorically speaking, the solid state that results from the congelation of the fluid state of living homogeneous human labor expended in production. So here he is fetishizing abstract labor. Like, 
in in this section, Marx is making the distinction between concrete and abstract labor. And Mosley is using this section to say, see, Marx said, this is, this is where labor comes from, but only exclusively from this abstract labor, which Marx is not, that's not what he's doing. He's laying out the differences. He's explaining the dual character. And Mosley's taking that and bending it into his argument. The next paragraph considers the quantitative feature of the magnitudes of value of the coat and linen, which are determined by the quantities of homogeneous labor time expended to produce the coat and the linen. On 136, Marx says, Coats and linen, however, are not merely values in general, but values of definite magnitude. And following our assumption, the coat is worth twice as much as 10 yards of linen. Why is there this different difference in value? because the linen contains only half as much labor as the coat. So that labor power had to be expended twice as long to produce the second, the coat, as to produce the first, 10 yards of linen. <laughs> yeah. And that's problematic. Like to take that as, see, that's where the difference in value is. Because it took twice as long to make the fucking coat than it did to fucking weave the linen. That's why the coat costs more than the linen. That's, that, that's problematic. In the next paragraph, Marx emphasizes again. It's kind of the like magnitude saying, of the value. Kind of like, of the is, isn't, it, isn't that kind of like saying... It's like you have a Marxist here just saying capitalism is just. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, no, guys, this is the way it works. He's like, no, it's just meritocracy, dude. You know, the reason that the <laughs> that they make so much more money over in this sector is because there's just more of, labor power. There's just going more into labor. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know how much more labor power goes into uh, working a desk job at Google than in cleaning toilets? It's just the way it is. Like, Dude, all the labor power expended in harvesting the minerals, all the manufacturing time, all the shipping costs, everything that went into that computer that your boss sits on and plays solitaire on all day. All that labor, all that labor time is tied up in your boss's paycheck. Whereas your paycheck is so small because all you have to do is eat and drive to work and clean a toilet. That's yeah, it. Think about it like that. That boss like has much bigger uh, means of subsistence. Like yeah. to, to hold that job, your boss actually has to go on yachts and golf courses with presidents and other CEOs. You know how expensive that is? So of course his means of subsistence are just greater, which it's all still based on socially necessary labor time. Like, yeah. Which is confusing. See, and I just, that's I, where I go back to feel, I go back to feeling like, well, we, we must be stupid. There's no way that Mosley like, yeah, he can't be saying that. Unless Mosley is saying that's the way it works and it's all bullshit, then he's right because it is all bullshit. And to take that <laughs> at face value yeah. and and run with it is wrong. So if Mosley is saying like all this shit is the way it works and it's wrong, then thumbs up Mosley. But if you're saying no, this is actually the way it really works. Period. Yeah. It's like, that's, that's the thing is that what Marx is doing is saying, this is the way that it works and it's bullshit. And it's bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> and Mosley, yeah. Mosley's like, see, Marx is saying that this is the way it works. You missed the part where he said, and it's bullshit though, which is yeah. um, really the culmination of the whole, of the whole chapter. Yeah. Like, was it not? 
Hold on. Where is the culmination of the, where is the last page of this chapter? Um, it's like 176, 177. So far, no chemist has ever discovered exchange value, either in a pearl or a diamond. The economists who have discovered this chemical substance and who lay special claim to critical acumen, nevertheless, find that the use value of material objects belongs to them independently of their material properties, while their value, on the other hand, forms a part of them as objects. What confirms them in this view is the peculiar circumstance that the use value of a thing is realized without exchange i.e. in the direct relation between the thing and man, while inversely its value is realized only in exchange, in a social process. Who would not call to mind at this point the advice given by the good Dogberry to the night watchman Seacole? To be well informed, to be a well-favored man is the gift of fortune, but reading and writing comes by nature. Which I am always just completely blown. I, I'm really confused by by the his example i know we tried to make i think we made sense of it last time and i i've already forgotten um that's uh i i, I, I think he's dunking on ricardo there but the real moment that I was looking for. Yeah. I think is on 165. The mysterious character of the commodity form consists therefore simply in the fact that the commodity reflects the social characteristics of men's own labor as objective characteristics of the products of labor themselves as the socio natural properties of these things. Hence, it also reflects the social relation of the producers to the sum total of labor as a social relation between objects, a relation which exists apart from and outside the producers. Through this substitution, the products of labor become commodities, sensuous things, which are at the same time supra sensible or social. In the, in the same way, the impression made by a thing on the optic nerve is perceived not as a subjective excitation of that nerve, but as the objective form of a thing outside the eye. In the act of seeing, of course, light is really transmitted from one thing, the external object, to another thing, the eye. It is a physical relation between physical things. As against this, the commodity form and the value relation of the products of labor within which it appears have absolutely no connection with the physical nature of the commodity and the material relations arising out of this. It is nothing but the definite social relation between men themselves, which assumes here for them the fantastic form of a relation between things. In order, right? So when you're comparing the socially necessary labor time in the things, you're really comparing a social relationship in the things. Exactly. But you're taking, exactly. you're, but you're erasing the fact that it's a social relationship and you're taking it to be an actual objectified value that's been that's, put there that, by the production that, process itself. That's the fetish, yeah. In order, therefore, to find an analogy, we must take flight into the mystery, misty realm of religion. There, the products of the human brain appear as autonomous figures endowed with a life of their own, which enter into relations both with each other and with the human race. So it, it is in the world of commodities with the products of men's hands. I call this the fetishism, which attaches itself to the products of labor as soon as they are produced as commodities and is therefore inseparable from the production of commodities. Exactly. That's it, dude. Inseparable from the production. Inseparable from the production. Inseparable from the fucking production. It's right it's, there, dude. It's inseparable. But this is... It's right this there, is, dude. But this is later... After he's brought exchange value back into the picture, because in this section, in pages 131 through 36, where we've been with Mosley this time, and Mosley keeps acting like what he's talking about is a proof. It's like, no, he's just saying this is how it works. But then it is on page 165 when he says, <laughs> and that's bullshit. Yeah. 
<laughs> which uh <laughs> I'm uh I am interested in seeing how uh I almost called him Ricardo, how how Mosley <laughs> I was about to say how Ricardo deals with this. I'm interested to see how Mosley deals with this. Uh. <laughs> with that, with that quote in particular. Yeah. Let's see what he says about that. Could you, yeah, can we just, okay. I mean, cause we got another 15 minutes here. I just, can we just jump? Okay. What page are we on? Let's not forget let's, our page. Let's finish this page. Let's finish okay. this page. Finish this page. And then, and we'll, then scroll. we'll control. And then we'll control F for 165. I just want to see what he says about 165. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. In and the I next mean, paragraph control F marks the whole book, you know, come on. <laughs> In the next paragraph, Marx emphasizes again that the magnitude of the value of a commodity is nothing but the quantity of labor represented in it. On 136, Marx says, since the magnitude of the value of a commodity represents nothing but the quantity of labor represented in it, it follows that all commodities, when taken in certain proportions, must be equal in value. And then Marx discusses again, as in section one, the effect of a change in the productivity of labor on the total value produced by a given quantity of labor and on the individual value of each unit of the commodities produced. An increase in productivity of a given quantity of labor leaves the total value produced unchanged and reduces the unit value of each commodity because less labor is required to produce a unit of the commodity. Again, the production of value, both the total value produced by a given quantity of labor and the unit of value of each commodity produced depends solely on the quantity of living labor expended to produce it and is independent of demand and the conditions of exchange. <sighs> and that was... Uh, Mosley's summation of pages 136 and, and 137. This is, wait, wait, this is the last it, page it, of this wait, section. Sorry, Let's it, finish sorry. this section. We'll, we'll finish this section, but sorry, just to go over that again. He ends it by saying independent of exchange. What's the... So, okay, again, the production of value, both the total value produced by a given quantity of labor and the unit value of each commodity produced depends solely on the quantity of living labor expended to produce it and is independent of demand and the conditions of exchange. No, that's a very useful quote for him, is it not? Yeah. Of course, he um, really likes that quote. And I want to underline it and make sure that we have it. Uh, where does it say it on the actual page? Can you find out where it says that? 136 to yeah, 137. Okay. This is a big old quote. Mm, again, an increase of the quantity is by two coats, nevertheless, an increase. So, this is production of value it cuts down as all labor's expenditure. Some of them, um, that's a summarization, not a quote. So Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, I'm trying fuck. to look for depends solely on the quantity of living labor expended to produce it, I think is probably oh, a I quote. See it. At bottom but the of 136. A change okay. One change has taken place, however, a change in the quantity of labor expended to produce the article. In itself, an yeah. increase in the quantity of use values constitutes an increase in material wealth. Two coats will clothe two men. One coat will only clothe one man. Nevertheless, an increase in the amount of material wealth may correspond to a simultaneous fall in the magnitude of its value. This contradictory movement arises out of a two-fold character of labor. By productivity, of course, we also mean, you know, we always mean the productivity of concrete useful labor. In reality, this determines only the degree of effectiveness of productive activity directed toward a given purpose within a given period of time. Useful labor becomes, therefore, a more or less abundant source of products in direct proportion as its pro productivity rises or falls. As against this, however, variations in productivity have no impact whatever on the labor itself represented in value. As productivity is an attribute of labor in its concrete useful form, it naturally ceases to have any bearing on on that labor as soon as we abstract from its concrete useful form. 
The same labor, therefore, performs for the same length of time, always performed for the same use, always yields the same amount of value independently of any variations in productivity, but it provides different quantities of use values during equal periods of time, more if productivity rises, fewer if it falls. For this reason, the same change in productivity, which increases the fruitfulness of labor and therefore the amount of use values produced by it, also brings about a reduction in the value of this increased total amount. If it cuts down the total amount of labor time necessary to produce the use values, the converse also holds. I don't understand how this does anything for him here. He's just talking it's, about it in this bracketed sense. He's just talking yeah, about exactly. how he's just trying to hone in on how socially necessary labor time functions to determine yep. something. That's all. Like, Where's the soul? Where's the word solely? Um, on the on the one hand, all labor is an expenditure of human labor power in the physiological sense, and it is in this quality of being equal or abstract human labor that it forms the value of commodities. On the other hand, all labor is an expenditure of human labor power on a particular form and with a definite aim. And it is in this quality of being concrete, useful labor that it produces use values. Well, that's fine. So what? It doesn't. But yeah, this the is probably editorializing. Next section, the next section is called the value form or exchange value. So yeah, he, said is, gonna, he said we're not going to talk about that for now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll but, yeah. And that's mostly, I, I, I don't, I, and that's, I don't know. It is baffling, dude. <laughs> Like it is, it really is. I don't know, man. Um, but that's why I rest you that paragraph because that's just that's just Mosley doing what he's been doing this whole section of this of this chapter, which it's well because he puts marks one thirty six through thirty seven in parentheses at the end of that. That's why I thought it was a quote when I looked up for my note taking. I was like, wait, that's a quote. Because it's like, yeah, well, no, be, it's not. That would be a really useful <laughs> quote. That would be a really useful quote for him, wouldn't it? He's like, he's yeah. putting those words in the mouth. No, Marx did not say depends solely on the quantity of living labor expended to produce it. He said, within this bracketed sense that we've set up over the last two sections, focusing on nothing but socially necessary labor time, a change in socially necessary labor time has a change on the magnitude of right. value. That's all. Okay. Well, and and he's he's taking like the the congealed, you know, the crystallized, objectified labor thing, and and really trying to spit shine it. Um. And it's it again. It's like no, Mosley. Marx is setting that bowling pin up because he's fucking rolling. He's hot, man. He just hit a turkey. He's about to roll a three hundred. You're over here. You're at the bar smoking cigarettes, drinking fucking Stella. You're not really paying attention. You're just seeing some highlights. You're trying to get laid. I, I see what you're doing, Mosley. But look, man, we're not here for that. We're we're here to practice bowling. It's almost like, and now this is where we we get unfair or uncharitable, or I'm just, <laughs> yeah. I'm just no, but I'm just gonna do it. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna own my humanity. I'm gonna I'm gonna own my frailty as a human and say that I can't help but feel like we're dealing with a Baptist minister. Dude. Yeah. Who is cherry pick, who is cherry picking scripture and who yeah. has a very, very fucking strong for conception going in. Yep. That's all. Dude. I honestly, I can't wait for Mikey to get to this part when he catches up to this part like last video and this one and probably the next few oh, i can't dude. wait to talk to mikey about this book and about the yeah like that's been going through my head like oh mikey's gonna have a heyday with mosley dude because it's such a perversion it's a perversion of what mikey does what mosley's doing line by line cherry picking bullshitting is a perversion of going line by line and really trying to draw out the meaning that's why it's it's so baffling that mosley would actually do that right like no he can't be doing this man 
the part of me that wants to go back to being fair though is just to say that anybody with a really <laughs> strong for anybody with a really strong for conception can sit there and read line by line and do yep. an exegesis and still walk away with something this crazy because you I, have I this really say, strong for conception. I won't even say we haven't we haven't done that. Like I'm sure we've missed some things. Or at least I have. Like I'm oh. I'm sure there's oh. things I've missed. Surely. Um that that I'm putting on the page or that I'm simply skipping over. And that's why there have been some commenters who have actually, you know, contributed. Um, and hopefully people moving forward will continue to be actual contributors instead of just like talking shit and saying, Oh, well you suck because Heinrich sucks. Like, no, if there's actually something we legitimately missed and you can say, no, here's what you missed. And then tell us what it is and tell us where to find it and be charitable and generous and all those things, then that's an actual contribution. If you're just like, well, you're stupid because you do this and I'm not going to explain it to you. I'm just going to assert that you're stupid and then carry on about my we, day. He, that's not a thing. contribution. We we've been more charitable to Mosley than those commenters have been to us or than Mosley has been to Heinrich. And that's clear. Uh, yeah. 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 It is. It's crazy to see people saying Heinrich is doing X, Y, and Z. He's just doing this. He's just doing that. It's like, I don't think he's just doing that dude. Yeah. Being, and like, I know oh, I've I read him being all like, I don't have to engage with being like straight up. I don't have to engage with Heinrich because he is one of those value form guys. And so is Patrick Murray and Kleiman already beat Patrick Murray. And it's like, I don't know who Patrick Murray is. I haven't read Kleiman's critique of him. I have no idea what's going on over there. All I can say is you're put you're saying Heinrich is saying something that if he's actually saying it, you should be able to point to me on the page where he said it. Otherwise it's slander or yeah. libel. It's, it's libel. Cause you're right. You're, you're doing it in the written form. So it's just libel. Yeah. Well, and, and it's like, whatever, man, I don't fucking slander libel. I don't give a shit. I really do want to know what's really going on. Um, yeah. Like, just, okay. Hearsay. Like get outside the legal terms. It's just hearsay. And the point is, is like, right. it, we're, we're trying to get outside of hearsay. We're trying to go to the sources. We're trying to actually work through yes. the secondary texts that disagree. So point to me on the page or shut up, you know? Yeah. Show, show me what, show me where, if you're going to talk about something, pretend it's show and tell, like yeah. actually bring it, hold it up and, and say, this is what I'm talking about. Don't just kind of create some fucking fantasy and vaguely, ex, you know, explain it and go sit back down in your seat. Like we're trying yeah. to, to actually deal with ideas and concepts and real things here. We're not just trying to do, let's toss about names and pretend we're all cool and smart and really radical. Like thinking yeah. isn't cool guys <laughs> or it's super uncool or whatever. All right. Last page. I, I promise not to interject until, until it's over. All right. In the final paragraph of section two, Marx summarizes again, the distinction between abstract human labor and concrete useful labor, the two characteristics of the labor expended in production to produce commodities on page 137. Marx says, on the one hand, all labor is an expenditure of human labor power in the physiological sense, and it is in this quality of being equal or abstract human labor that it forms the value of commodities. On the other hand, all labor is an expenditure of human labor power in a particular form and with a definite aim, and it is in this quality of being concrete useful labor that it produces use values. Thus, all the different kinds of concrete useful labors are expenditures of human labor that are equal in, in a physiological sense, human brains and muscles, etc., without special training. And it is in this quality of being physiologically equal abstract human labor in the production of commodities that labor produces the value of commodities. Thus, Marx's concept of abstract human labor presupposes the physiological equality of all kinds of human labor, pure and simple but is not identical with physiological equal labor. Abstract human labor is physiologically equal labor with a historically specific qualification. Abstract human labor is physiologically equal labor in a commodity economy that is manifested and regulated through the exchange of commodities. This point will be discussed in further detail in the next chapter. Soon after the publication of the first edition of volume one, Marx wrote two letters in which he mentioned the two or three best points 
of his book, and in both cases, one of the best points was the twofold character of labor in section two of chapter one. <clears throat> the best points in my book are one, the twofold character of labor, according to which it is expressed in the use value or exchange value. All understanding of the facts depends upon this. It is emphasized immediately in the first chapter. The three fundamentally new elements of the book. Two, that the economists, without exception, have missed the simple point that if the commodity has a double character, use value and exchange value, then the labor represented by the commodity must also have a dual character. While the mere analysis of labor as such, as in Smith and Ricardo, etc., is bound to come up everywhere against inexplicable problems. That is, in fact, the whole secret of the critical conception. So that's I want to I want to see this this letter though for sure because uh, oh, first of all on its own this does nothing uh, but this would be where I want Marx to actually just come out and say his right thing that about how it's all ultimately fetishization but as far as like his contribution as to the twofold of uh, character of labor that doesn't change anything and it doesn't change the fact that abstract labor de de determined by social necessary labor time is not itself dependent on the relationship of production in a class society and that he's that that's being reified you know like but does he say that in the letter i don't know i want to see i want to see because i just at this point i really i don't trust mosley anymore guys I said earlier on that I'd, yeah. I would rush. I said I said I would rush to print anything for this guy when we started out. I said, "Yeah, man, if you were in a hurry to publish this, you should come with come with us next time. We'll 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 publish it for you, and we'll actually proofread it." Um, because he didn't get a a proofreader, and it's obvious. But like, um, you know, uh, offer rescinded for real. I just don't trust like that anymore. <laughs> I think I have a sound bite for that somewhere. I'm trying to dig it up. <laughs> Took me a second, but. Harry's car place. I don't trust like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Okay. I gotta see. I gotta see if Mosley says anything about the fetish. Yeah, just word search 165. I'm alright. I'm I'm already too deep in, man. I'm scrolling. I don't trust anybody like that. I don't trust something like that. Harry's car place. I don't trust like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, dude. Okay. You Mysterious in the fourth paragraph, the first sentence states Marx's conclusion thus far. And then at the end of this paragraph, Marx describes the fetishism of commodities with an analogy to religion in the misty realm of religion. In the next one sentence paragraph, Marx states his conclusion regarding the origin of the fetishism of commodities. So this, like, Mosley's just doing a chronology here. Like, he's not dealing with... When Marx says that the general properties of labor take on the form of objective properties of commodities, this means that there is a causal relation between these presupposed properties of labor and the objective properties of commodities, including with respect to the magnitude of the value of commodities. The quantity of human labor expended to produce a commodity takes on the form of the magnitude of the value of the commodity. This clear statement directly contradicts Heinrich's interpretation that the magnitude of the value of commodities is not determined solely by labor expended production, but instead also depends on supply and demand for the commodity in exchange on the market. Uh, yeah. Except no. 
like it's pure ideology yeah I think Mosley got third paragraph argues that the mysterious character of commodities arises from the fact that in a commodity economy, these general properties are like, so it seems like Mosley is just putting his feet down and saying, no, we know it's fucky, but we, but we know it comes from labor. How'd you do that? It's actually, I'm not even mad. That's amazing. <laughs> I, I I'm not even mad. That's amazing. So, so Mosley is saying, no, it seems like there's this fucky bullshit going on, but really it's just a mystification of the fact that it's just objectified labor. That's where value comes from. It sounds like, like that's the stance that Mosley is taking where he's saying, yes, we know this mystification, this fetishization is fucky. Um, but we know better and we know value is rooted in abstract human labor. Okay. It seems so like that's you, what Mosey's so, doing. And I don't understand that. So you know, like the you know, like the two the two main dialectics positions of one, it's other basically Hegel is a sophisticated version of Fichte, and it's thesis antithesis synthesis or it's actually like there's always this fourth thing and the synthesis is not uh able to resolve because there's always this remainder and Mander, yeah and contradiction and negativity can never be synthesized in this in this beautiful way and i think from the zizekian mcgowan type of position marx uh more or less, I think, falls into the the wrong understanding of Hegel here. Let's go with that for a second and say that uh, that's the case. And that Marx has, you know, this idea that as a young Hegelian, he turned Hegel on his head uh, through Feuerbach and the, like the dialectical um, thing that he does to use Feuerbach and then go beyond both Hegel and Feuerbach. Uh, and so, okay. In either of those readings of dialectics, though, you do not read chronologically taking what's first as truest. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's insane. Like, that's a, it, like it's a textbook where we started out with the founding principles and then everything else follows from those founding principles. And there's never like a, a radical requilting. There's never a radical retroactive change. I'm sorry. What would dialectics be without radical requiltings? He comes forward. He says, "We're going to bracket out you uh, exchange value and the value form." So here's how it here's how it works, folks. I've, I'm adding something, though. I'm adding socially necessary labor time. Oh, in the next section, I'm adding something. I'm adding yeah, concrete versus abstract forms of labor. And he's very proud of himself because he's taking the standard political economist position, and then he's adding to it. So he's making a real contribution to the field at the same time that he is overcoming it because he is dialectically unfolding a book that it's it's dialectical in both its mode of presentation as well as in its actual analysis of the subject matter, which is supposed to be dialectical itself. So whether dialectics is this thesis antithesis synthesis or it actually it, it has this uh irresolvable negative remainder in either of those situations we can say for sure the mosley is just incapable of dialectical thinking and that he's yeah. not that he's not taking mark seriously as someone who is thinking about this as a dialectical subject matter or that he is as a writer presenting it in a dialectical presentation i think like politically in quotes if you will it's it's very easy to say that um the left once again in quotes like forgot about dialectics because they they 
want to maintain these hardline stances. And actually, McGowan is really good at, uh, really good with that. And and drumming right and left, I think the way the way he lays it out in that short book that I have here somewhere, it's really. Is it the Emancipation After Hegel one? No. Um, Enjoyment right and left. Why the fuck is oh, it? Oh shit. Oh, it's right here. Is his most recent sublation book, or not most recent, but um he's really good. It, anyway, I I think it's it's actually really easy to say the left, the political left, has kind of forgotten dialectics. But to to say like I don't know what what is Mosley. I don't I don't know. Is he is he just an economist? Is he a political thinker? I don't know what he is. But to say he's taking Marx, but he's leaving out dialectics is actually I don't know that that that's a really like stark. I think. It's extreme truth. It, it, it is extreme, but, but I do think like, no, so many of these people who, are, who take these like binary stances are like, they're thinking, yes, I am a Marxist. I am a Marx understander, but they, they have these binary, these dichotomies, right? They, they don't, they don't think dialectically. I don't know. It's just, it's like, damn, that's, that's pretty harsh. Um, I don't think it's wrong. I just think if, if I were proclaiming publicly, I'm a very smart Marx understander and I am smart and I write books about Marx. And if it was very, very clear that I didn't understand like the dialectic unfolding of all things, I don't know. I would, I would just be like, Oh wow, you called me out. And, and it, that, that, that cuts actually pretty deep. I don't know. But it's He's, true. It's very true of a lot of people who claim to be Marxists. They're stuck in binary thinking. They, they can't deal with things as they are. They have to take everything as a dichotomy, as, as a binary. It's this or it's that. And it's not that. So it's necessarily, it must be this. Like that is how people fucking deal with things. And Seems to be how the, that, that's how Mosey's dealing with it. He's like, yes, thing the first, thing the second, thing the third. I am right. Fuck you. Fuck Heinrich. I don't know, man. It's crazy. Dude, like, it's funny that he says the logic in section three is a continuation of the logic of sections one and two. And it's just like, <laughs> yes, but what kind of logic was he into was it <laughs> fucking i don't know british empiricist syllogisms <laughs> come on guys yeah. yeah well he was obviously a positivist so there we go that's Duh. all it is nothing to see here folks um Yeah, it's fucking weird, guys. Um, I kind of expected a little something more here. Yeah, dude, and uh, to be honest, I actually feel kind of bad about that. Like, I feel bad for having that position. Like, I still want to give Mosey credit. I'm, I'm still waiting for Mosey to do an unfolding himself. But so far, it seems like he's not going to. And he's just running with this naive labor theory. Everything is, you know, everything comes down to these crystallizations of abstract labor. And if that is all he's doing, then it's like, no, Mosley, you're wrong, dude. But if he's just taking up that position now to unfold something else later, then I'm here for it. 
It just makes me want to cut someone up with a chainsaw. I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> This world's hell yeah, so fucked up. Yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, hold on, let I, I, I'm having fun with sound bites now. Like I'm just, I'm done. It's just time to meme oh, our dude. way out of here. Okay, look up succulent Chinese meals, dude. Yeah, I can't believe you haven't seen this. I forgot to send it to you. All right, all right. Let's see. What? It's just a video? that has to go on the soundboard. Just uh, probably YouTube. Just Google uh. Succulent oh, Chinese it. meal. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Let's uh let's put this on the I'll make it so other people can see it. So it's just the first thing that comes up, I'm sure. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, just the old shitty video of the Australian guy. Need me to stop sharing? Just, no, you you're just good. assured me that I could speak. Sit down inside the car. We're not assuring anything. We're under arrest. Look, I'm under what? Gentlemen, this is Democracy Manifest. <laughs> Have a look at the headlock here. See that chap over there? Get your hand, hand off my penis. my penis. This is the bloke who got me on the penis before. Get some cups. Why did you do this to me? Get some cups. For what reason? What is the charge? Eating a meal? A succulent Chinese meal? Oh, that's a nice headlock, sir. Oh, ah, uh, yes. <laughs> I see that you know oh. your judo well. Good one. Know your judo and well. You, sir, are you waiting to receive my limp penis? How dare you? And it's not even. <laughs> it's not even a headlock. Yeah. It's not even a headlock. It's not even. It's not. I actually have a soundbite that goes perfectly with this, and it goes. Here we go. I'm gonna. Let's see if I can play it. See, now that's just not the way to go here, Karen. It's just, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's just not the way to go here, Karen. It's just not. Okay, I'm going to record Dude, this, though. I'm going to make this recording right now. But, oh, it go, what? I just, that, the succulent Chinese meal, dude, that's one of the best videos on the internet. Like, it really is. There's so much there. Get your <laughs> hand off my penis. <laughs> Are you waiting to receive my limp penis? It's the fucking best thing ever, dude. Put your hand off my penis! <laughs> I'll start it. I'll start it right there. Let's do it. See that chap over there? Get your hand off my penis! This is the bloke who got me on the penis before. Why did you do this to me? For what reason? What is the charge? Eating a meal? A succulent Chinese meal? Oh, that's, that's perfect. I'm going to just trim that down to size and add it to the soundboard yeah, now. Yeah, um, in the longer run, once we have some like some people who are just here for it every week in the Zoom side, yep. uh, we can always add to the soundboard. This is a fun activity. Get your hand off. We'll start it with get your hand right here. Get your hand off my penis! This is the bloke who got me on the penis before. Get some cups. Why did you do this? I'm gonna cut out that part and just start it like this. Why did you do this? Pop in the car. Get some cups. For what reason? What is the charge? Eating a meal? A succulent Chinese meal? There you go. So apparently that guy, like, there's a lot of lore with that guy, and I don't know what the true story is. It's either. It's either the case that he was like an international fraud guy or they like got the wrong guy. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, so that guy was either like an international like credit card thief or he was just an innocent guy eating his succulent Chinese meal and he got fucking locked up for no reason. In which case, you know, my, my, uh, my heart really goes out to him that, uh, you know, there's nothing better than a succulent Chinese meal. <laughs> Dude, it's there's nothing better. Yeah. All right, folks. Um, so wait, could you just control F one sixty five and and see how many times it even comes up in the document? I just want to know. Does he just think that he settles the score right here in this section? 
Comes up five times. First two. Um, where he's just doing this chronology and he's saying like, yeah, Marx is talking about this mysterious process, but we know the truth. Right. And the truth is that it's crystallized objectified labor. Same thing. And that's it. Yeah, that's the one mention. Let me control F fetish. See. So there's 35 minutes in that section. Same section, same section, same section, same section, same section, same section. Uh, later on. Okay, so at least he deals with it a little more. Um, so it looks like he deals with it in two sections of the book. Well, he would have to. Mm, three. Does does he deal three with sections. it in the section where he gets into Heinrich? Yeah, because that that would be yeah. That's Heinrich. But it only it only comes up three times when he's talking about Heinrich. So he talks about the fetish and Marx twice, and then one section devoted to Heinrich. So is the is the so <sighs> the posi- is the position he holds then that fetishism especially as dealt with on pages 165 through 66 is that that's only um speaking about uh the what fe- the fetish character of the commodity is only that um it's that it exchange covers value up. covers up yeah. its actual use value and it's and it's basis in the production so yep. you know this is like the greenpeace video called the story of stuff where it focuses on the golden arrow and it, and it basically the whole yep. point is is like when you're standing in the grocery the the halls of the grocery store you're looking at the shelf what you're missing is this whole context of production and distribution and that cuts out yep. the cost of production uh, uh the co- the real cost on the laborers who are being exploited on the the earth that is being decimated right so it's a very you know it's like that's that is not sold as marx it's just you know, it's just like, but of course it is. They're kind of standard Marxist take on things. But of course, the point is, is that that's, it, it's, no, even if the prices represented the actual cost, it's still It would still, still would be, be bullshit. Yeah. That's and the even, thing. And, and that's even, what Marx is, like, Marx clearly, again, I'm probably projecting, but I think Marx is clear on that. Where he's not just saying, oh, this ideology covers up total cost. He's saying the, the, the contrived situation you're in where your life is dictated by the idea of cost and value in the first place is bullshit. Um, and that's, that, that's what you're missing when you settle for this labor theory value. I was just thinking, like, when we were reading this, I was... I was thinking, I kind of don't give a shit. Like, I'm not really invested in. No, of course you're not. Oh, because you, the... you, you already had this position. Your position right. was actually independent of Marx's position. And you actually thought that, I think, you just thought you disagreed with Marx until we read Heinrich, in which case, I think it was then that you were like, oh, yeah, no, this is what I think, actually. Is that? I, I, I think I, I think I took like a post Marxist position, maybe influenced by Bataille, maybe uh, not, maybe definitely. Or, and Baudrillard. I read some Bataille. I read some Baudrillard. I thought, well, they're post Marxist. So I'm a post Marxist too. Cause they're disagreeing. Now, with, they're disagreeing with Marx as well. Like, but the thing is, is once again, when Baudrillard disagrees with Marx, he's just, he just disagreeing with the dudes in the street or in his classroom. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So coming back to Marx after all this time, it's like, okay, um, you know, we, we don't have to settle for this naive labor theory of value. We don't because Marx doesn't. And I don't think I like, I don't think it's like, no, 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 it's bullshit. Cause it's not saying that like that is still operant. That is still there. It, it is an expansion pack. Marx is adding on to the labor theory of value. He's saying, look, the labor theory of value operates in this way to keep you trapped in this system. And the system is bullshit. 
And then Bataille and Baudrillard come along later to say, yeah, well, we don't have to think like Bataille's like, we don't just have to think about productivity. We can also think about expenditure. And Bataille is also, we don't have to think just about productivity and expenditure. We can also think about signification. The, n like never in that process is there like, well, they're wrong and I'm right. They're saying, well, they're right about this, but they missed something. So it's always this process of, yeah, this is going on, but they missed something. This is going on, but they missed something. Um, so, but yeah, I was like, I was thinking like, man, I, I am kind of just disinvested from this whole labor theory of value thing. I don't know, being, being the form of the content that we're creating right now, it's on the internet. It's going to be set up as like a binary of like, we're on this one position opposing the labor theory of value. And then there's all these people who take up the labor theory of value. Mm, That's a consequence yeah. of, of the form of what's happening right now. Um, and I don't care. But, but it does matter because settling for this labor theory of value keeps you trapped in that Greenpeace logic of the total cost. It, it keeps you trapped in only caring about the total cost. It doesn't allow you to think, well, I don't care. I want more. I want more right. no matter what. I'm not going to settle for this little bullshit box. You, and you that's what matters. You fall into the position that Sylvia Federici has. You fall into the position that Nancy Fraser and Rahal Yegi have. You fall into the position that Annie, what her name is, at Greenpeace has. Annie Leonard, Annie Leonard or Annie Leopold, I forget. But the story is Stuff Lady. In all such cases, all of them are holding this position that the shadow work, the expropriated labor the externalized costs have to just be reimbursed or somehow included which is like half correct they have to be included in a general like sort of acknowledgement by people who are involved in actually rethinking how to experiment with a restructuration whether it's reformist or you know extreme, it doesn't matter. The, like the people it has to be accounted for. Have to account for it. But as soon as yep. you're just saying, "Oh, the solution is that it just gets paid or it gets paid as proper cost," bitch, you're reifying it now. Yep. Where people just want to do this redistribution, and they're like, "No, let's redistribute costs. Let's redistribute wealth. Let's redistribute." No. Let Let's do that. We do need to have a you know a, a reimagined system where cost is redistributed where benefit is re redistributed and shit but that's not the end because then we're just trapped in a workerism um dude i had no idea i had no idea like i had not like bataille and baudrillard had not clicked enough for me yet i'd read enough dude, i'm I'd read, saying dude i had I'm read saying. some i had read some of them uh but i had no idea i had no idea like they're it's like, okay, there's this wonderful wiggle room to be able to be like, ah, actually, Marx was more Bataillean and Baudrillardian than we thought. But mm -hmm. ultimately, who gives a shit? The reality of it is that at, at bottom, this is how this fucking thing works. And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you're a Marxist or if you're a Von Mises, bro. At, <laughs> you're, at, at, you're just telling, you're, you're just gaslighting. People who are born into a system who believe mm. that the reason they can't afford their rent is because they're not being paid the value of their work, when in reality, half the work that's being done, at least half the work that's being done by laborers across the world, doesn't even have to be done in the first place. Yeah. Right? It's... And that a lot of the people who think that, oh, yeah, well, I'm worth so much more because my labor power has been qualified through an education system don't realize that the number one role and function of that education system was to get out ahead of and undermine any potential for labor organizing. And that it's a yep. for, it's it's a foreclosed long over. It's it's, it's been complete and, and the, the deal has been sealed for a long time now. And now the people who come along and are like, we just need to organize the workers. The workers just need to organize. It's just on them. Without them organizing, there's just nothing. Are the ones who, in the short term, stand to gain from this division of labor and the reification of 
the necessity of that labor, which is not actually necessary. And yeah, the unification of the meritocracy. So, um, you know, it feels which, good to yeah, it feels good to know that uh, that all of this stuff we've been doing for the last year ties together. So, yeah, no, and in it, I don't know. I, I do think it's worth saying, like, again, because of the form, it's always going to come off oppositional. Uh, <laughs> but like it's it's not about it's not about oh let's score let's score internet points and let, let's be the smart post marxists over here like no 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 like it really is like let's get to the bottom of this um so i it, just it's it's not about like yeah fuck mosa he sucks it's about like well no mosa you're you're wrong and and here's why and let's see if we can figure it out i don't know Look, man, no matter what we do, even though you say that, even though I say that, even though we've been very careful to be probably, yeah, more charitable than it's perhaps even due, nothing's going to change the fact that people here who hear our tone of voice uh, are going to walk away from this if they want to, calling us a bunch of theory bros, and I don't give a shit, and they can suck my <laughs> fucking dick. I don't care. And you want to be taken as like a, you want to be taken as like some kind of nice guy. And I get it, but I don't care. <laughs> Fuck you guys. I don't care. We don't have to be nice. The internet's not a nice place. It's definitely not a safe place. We definitely shouldn't be fragile or careful with one another here. Uh, at a certain level, it's like if I was, if I was having a real conversation with any of these guys, I'm going to have like, a baseline kind of respect that I have for human beings. But when we're constantly feeling like we're being gaslit and everyone's being like uncharitable to us and and then we like paint ourselves yeah. into this little corner where we are irrelevant because we don't allow the contradictions to shine or the fact that we're fucking correct sometimes to actually come out where we can actually just go, uh, no. You're so wise. You're wrong. Oh, that's a wrong. Sorry, I wanted to do... Uh, this is the, this is the, I'll, I'll show that sound bite in a second. I meant to do this one, right? That's a, sorry, sorry, Mosley. You're wrong. It's just, you're wrong. <laughs> and, uh, it's like, I don't know. Like it's, it's like maybe before you like rush a book to print or, or press, like, you know, Terry with the goddamn thing, you know, I, 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 like, I don't think, I don't think Mosley to I don't know to make some assumptions of my own. I I don't think Mosley or any of these people who are these labor theory of value Marxists who are publishing books and who are really hung up there. I I don't think they could tarry long enough to see where they've gone wrong, and that's a consequence of I guess the discourse, um, or as as uh, Daniel would say, the rhetoric. Like the way it is right now, it's just. No, that has to come from people like us. The position we take has to come from the outside because on the inside, it's just a fucking labor theory circle jerk. So. But guys, I, I, I straight up, I straight up without. Uh, Mikey and Nance in their own ways, pushing back against a, a basic labor theory of value. Marxism for my last many years. Um, and without having already read Heinrich, I would have probably read this undialectically and just taken sections one and two to be the real position that he's holding. And then I would have taken section three to just be, oh, the fetishization is just forgetting about the production itself. And then I would have gone on my merry way reading the rest of the book. And the thing is, is like, you know, we're in good company. So is so like the thing mm. is, is like Mosley's in a weirder position because he's he he's like he's a professional. You know, he's part of the PMC. He like as an expert is supposed to really fucking, you know, rest from this field 
the meaning in, uh, 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 between these positions and like actually like try to understand the constituent contradictions of this field. Um, and he's not seemingly done that. And then uh, we're the dumb fuck workers who are like over here going, you know, trying to read this. Okay, but beyond that, you know, like, okay, someone like Lenin or Kotsky taking Marx to be doing this basic labor theory value thing. Um, they, they had a little bit more going for them. It, it allows us to be a bit more charitable to them than to Mosley. And that is that Heinrich hadn't written the goddamn book yet. Pastone hadn't written his goddamn book yet. And Maddock wasn't doing what he was doing. So it's like there's all of these people who've contributed to the field. And then the people who are like, nope, it's just what it's always been. Don't even think about it. It's like, yeah, that's I'm I I'm just like, okay. I I just I I'm at this point where I'm like, it's We'll we'll get through this book and we'll eventually come back around to reading uh Patrick Murray and Kleiman's debate. And you know, I want to get to the bottom of these kinds of disagreements. I want to work through um the disagreement between uh David Harvey and uh Roberts. What's his name? Is it Michael Roberts or is it something Robert? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Roberts. Um, Michael Roberts. I think it's Michael Roberts. Uh yeah, so like they've had a back and forth via blogs and articles. Um and I think Michael Roberts is a bit more of this uh worldview Marxist tendency. David Harvey is a bit more of this like kind of just a sociologist tendency. Um at the end of the day, it's like I don't come down so strongly politically on the side of the guys like Heinrich or if Harvey is also on board with it. I don't really actually know. I, 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 what is unique to Harvey's contribution outside of the concept of anti-value? I don't actually know. Um, you know, like he, like I, I, uh, Max was asking why we started with Heinrich instead of starting with Harvey. Um, and my answer was like, not great. It was like, well, you know, this is just what I find more interesting, you know? This seems, this is more interesting to me. Like, Harvey's not going to start the thing out by saying there's this distinction between worldview Marxists and what I'm doing. The fact that. Yeah, and I, 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 I don't think. Heinrich having that. I don't approach, think you should sell yourself short. I think that is a good enough reason. Because that's your awareness of an issue. It's not just bullshit, right? Like, that's, that's you coming to the conversation with you're bringing something to the table already right so i well, like i would i would just say is, like it's not as arbitrary as it might seem as just like oh i picked this guy over this guy like no the fact that heinrich does call out this worldview marxist and then he proceeds to show that Marx is not so easily debunked by contemporary theories of money and value. Um, and that actually, in a lot of ways, Marx is preempting guys who then proceed to act like they're dunking on Marx, when in reality, they're just arguing with these worldview Marxists. It's like, that's a powerful point to me. And then I already knew going in uh, this last, you know, when we were reading through this, I knew, okay, there's some, there's something going on in this book about the labor theory of value versus something else. I don't really get it. And then I'd been clued into the contradiction by Dale Tut being like, oh, value for Marx is, they suck. And I was like, oh, okay. That makes it more relevant because he's a real Marxist. We, we met on tour. He's actually in DC. He's actually vying for political power. Like I'm actually in, or he wants to influence people who are. So I'm interested in, it's all more relevant. It's supercharged by uh, the times. And when I, when I listen to Harvey and when I, when I try to read Harvey, I just get extremely bored. Um, like I just get bored. And I think that, it's it's kind of like there's a I mean it's the same is true of Dr. Adolf Reed Jr. He's a boring guy to read unless you know why he's doing what he's doing and what conflicts lie beneath the surface. 
Um, but without somebody to make that really clear, he just speaks in this very like calm sort of way where he's just going to walk you through things, but he doesn't teach by contradictions. And to me, I've got to actually know what the contradictions are. Like this is like Varifakis's book, which is a, a companion to any economics textbook. Um, Verif he he's like, I'm going to teach you by contradiction and show you that the textbooks are telling you this is how it is. This is how it is. This is what we've come to the conclusion of. And then in each case, they're just, they're choosing a winner in an ongoing debate. And I think that that kind of teaching is, first of all, dialectical. Second of all, it's just, I mean, it's, I, people, people think that like, uh, like it's just drama baiting to, to, to go where the contradictions lie, but it's actually like, there's not an objective subject matter outside of those contradictions. People think that there's an objectively true position in economics and you could just read about it. And it's like, you can't understand the subject matter without understanding the actual lived, argued kind of positions where people sacrifice their careers uh, and their, their, all their time, energy, and attention um, and go to conferences or, and develop schools and disciplines that take this side versus that side on these certain issues. And yeah, these people have like their politics and their, the, you got to understand these things. And there is no understanding any subject matters without that. And so I think that, like, that's what I'm getting at when I want Daniel Tutt and Nina Power to have a conversation. That's what I'm getting at when I want um, uh, uh, Jonas Cheka and Daniel Tutt to have a conversation. Anybody who's, like, out here, or Christine Luigi Soli versus Ashley Frowley, uh, or versus Nina Power, like, all these people, it's like, please. Flesh your shit out. Don't be abstract all the time. Actually bring it into relation with actual other people in the field or in the scene um, and do it in a way that plans to come back and like read through the shit and tarry with it and then come back again. Otherwise, it's just worldview cur curation. You're just appealing to predetermined marketing demographics. And it, it's not illuminative. Like you think it's so like maybe people tell you, oh, I learned so much. Thank you. But I'm over here telling you, I didn't learn as much as I could have if you would just actually let the contradictions air and flesh them out. And that's what we're trying to do here with like, yeah, starting this all off with Heinrich and then going through it and then going back and bringing in mostly bring it. It's like after we've gone through a few people's versions of chapter one, the whole book is going to open up in a different way. Where, once again, just like Harvey, something very, very boring and sterilized in a sort of academic sense, all of a sudden becomes so interesting because you see what he's actually doing. But oh, yeah. they, don't lead, they don't lead with clickbait, you know what I mean? Guys like Harvey. And honestly, Marx doesn't in this book either. Like, a lot of times Marx does, but just not in, the, not in his CPE. So. We got to go, though. We got to eat. Um, closing thoughts. Part of me is um, still holding out hope that Mosley will have his own unfolding here. Because um, I, I don't want it to be that, I don't know, limp of an argument. Because it's like it's tired and I've already been down that road. I hope I hope he does more, even if it's more of the same, but just a more complex and more fleshed out version of what he's already done. And I think I, I have faith he probably will do something a little more than what he's already done. Although what I've seen um, doesn't give me any reason to have that hope. Um, it is the, you know, the symbolic fact that he is this professional, well-respected guy or whatever. Uh, but I'm willing to be charitable with that. But then you know the other part of me is is like yeah the, you're you're just wrong dude um it, and maybe maybe you should stop talking for a while and start listening and by the end of uh of of reading this book hopefully that conflict will have resolved itself and i'll have landed on one side or the other we keep doing this, but at this point, I'm just like, man, if that, if that's how he's going to approach section 1.3 and this is chapter one. And in chapter two, he deals with Heinrich 
And that just means he thinks he's laid out the truth here in chapter one, and now he's ready to run his conclusions from chapter one against Heinrich, which means it's going to be like just beating our heads against the wall. So, you know, um, I, I almost feel like that, uh, like Daniel, Daniel Garner's how to read, like, yeah. it's like, it's like, dude, that shit needs to be like, we need to write that shit out. I, I'm going to ask him to write it out for a book, a book we're going to do on method. And then, you know, we'll be able to like measure stuff like this against it. Cause it, it's like, yeah, you, th when, when a biblical literalist, uh, read something, they don't understand that interpretation is part of it. They, they think mm. that they just have a direct access to the thing itself, but the only thing they have direct access to is their four conception. Yep. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, this has been fun guys. Uh, love it. Uh, love you all. Um, have a great one and, uh, we'll catch you next week. All right. Okay. Stay hard. Thinking is super uncool and that's why you should do it. It's just like almost anything that's like cool anymore. Um, yeah, it just sucks. And I think that's like what the underground movement has always been about is just like seeing what's in the mainstream being like, it ain't there. And kind of like cobbling something together, you know, and, and yeah, it's a little mismatched, but that's like its beauty. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. We bring primary texts from leading lights of diverse fields to bear on topical issues and works popular in our current world. Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. And, uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best editing collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. Seriously. This is a little experiment in what I, David McCarricker, can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. Usually a good editing collection has good essays, but you only want to read a few. Every essay makes me want to read the other essays because you have a vision. Everyone that you invited, you invited for a reason. You weren't some fake publicist. He's like, hey, someone says a new book, have them on your show. No, you only talk to people because you've read shit by them that you've right, thought right, about, that you right. think has value, even if you disagree. So I think that's what's amazing. I believe that I am, like so many others, pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning as a way of life enjoyable and emancipatory. However, before these tools become accessible, they have to be experimented with. That's why I built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages, five patrons, and some small classes of students over the last year. Of course, I also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting so that I don't get in trouble with the IRS or whatever. In less than a year, Theory Underground has already put out eight courses, two books, one, my book, Time Energy, and the other, Underground Theory, which has over 30 contributors, including works written by students at Theory Underground, some of my fellow travelers, and colleagues in the broader universe of underground theory. Beyond the books and courses, though, you will also find interviews, reading exegetical reaction sessions, and live weekly events for working class autodidacts, independent researchers, and renegade academics. These include a variety of clubs and cohorts that meet on a weekly or monthly basis. If you want to get involved, there are four main subscription levels. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. The point is to make learning, practice, and theoretical comprehension a way of life. Support at this stage of the operation is more crucial than ever because my savings were used up over the last year of getting this established. If I can triple my subscribers in the next two months, I can quit my gig at Amazon 
and focus on this work full time. All I need is a few more people at each of the levels or a couple big time patrons who just want to see it happen. Right now I am doing a patron and site subscriber drive. So excuse the commercial. But if you end up really liking what goes on at this channel, consider signing up soon. If you cannot afford it, but want to get involved with some of the stuff behind the paywall, I have made a financial aid scholarship you can sign up for here in the description. Quick side note, some people ask about the profit motive. At this point, I have not actually made a return on any of my investment in terms of the amount of time energy that I put into things, the amount of savings I've actually put into things, the opportunity cost of the work that I'm doing as opposed to the other kinds of things that I could be doing for money. Uh, but more importantly, I don't actually make enough to pay for my cost of living. The goal is to make enough for my cost of living. And then once that is achieved, everything over that amount is going to go towards expanding the operation to the point where I can hire Michael Downs, AKA Mikey of The Dangerous Maybe, to be a full-time researcher and part-time teacher at Theory Underground. All right, so with that aside, I just wanna say also, if you are a worker with earbuds, what's up? I see you. I work at Amazon part-time and everything I do is for my past self who used to work there full-time. Most workers with earbuds couldn't care less about theory, but I do believe a working class intellectual revolution could grow out of the underground theory scene. My hope is that what I have built here will contribute to making the scene something more than just a scene and you into something more than just a scene kid. We're trying to make this into a real intellectual milieu capable of leading a way forward beyond the imminent crises facing humanity. But for that, we need thinking now more than ever. Start thinking. I hope that you either will or have enjoyed the program and also make sure to like, comment, subscribe and leave this playing in the background all the time while you're doing other things. Playing long form theory underground content in the background while you do things has, in the near future, been scientifically proven to emancipate minds from the functional illiteracy imposed on workers by the structural stultification of time energy. This is achieved by re-territorializing circumspective concern. Also, to some degree, it is for the algorithm. Think of it like a gym membership but for your mind! <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> I love you too.